I've just realized that it's two minutes past 11, so we might as well start. So, what a great morning. It's been listening to experts such as Dave, Lucy, Watson, Ross, and Sarah on um, scoping a seaweed biorefinery for Ireland. It would make you all, almost forget about this big C word, COVID, and lockdown. But despite not being able to meet face to face, it's been a great week in promoting the Irish bioeconomy and the great work that is ongoing, how the bioeconomy is a strength for Ireland that can lead to and create new jobs, grow Ireland's GDP, while also achieving green targets of reduced carbon emissions and sustainability. So speaking of sustainability and why we're here today, it's no surprise that with over 25% of the Irish coastline in, in the Gaeltacht, Uderus has placed special emphasis on natural resource development and as such is a key theme in our current strategy and will receive a strategic focus going forward in our newly drafted strategy for the next five years. This is one of the main reasons we are active in Irish bioeconomy development as the bioeconomy promotes better use of natural resources through adding value in a sustainable manner. Cleana and Roy will talk to you next about SW Grove, an EU-funded project which came about through Uderus and Geltofte undertaking an assessment of our client company needs in the seaweed sector and working with our partners in other MPA regions to help overcome the challenges they face. Cleana is the SW Grove project officer with us here in the Uderus and she also works closely with clients in the seafood sector. Roy is a postdoc researcher with Lewis Castle College in the Isle of Lewis where he focuses on next generation cooling systems. Other project partners are also in attendance today. So I won't keep you any longer. I'll pass the mic or the unmute to Cleana. I just hope you enjoy the next two hours and make sure to ask as many questions and interact as much as possible to get the most out of these sessions. Oh, and before I get, this webinar is recorded and will be made available um, shortly afterwards. Hello everybody and welcome. I'm just about to share my screen there so that you can see what I will be talking about. So um, thank you for the warm welcome, Maura. Um, I'll just wait for this to pop up. So my name is Cleona Nidifa and I'm working as a project officer on SW Grow. SW Grow is funded by the Northern Periphery and Arctic Programme, which is an EU fund. This project has been going since August of 2019 and will last for about three years. Um, the pre presentation today will be a brief overview of SW Grow, our project objectives and what we have done to date. And following that, I'll be forwarding on to Roy to discuss his latest paper under SW Grow. So the main objective of SW Grow is to increase the economic opportunities in the seaweed industry. We aim to do this by, innovate, by developing innovative working practices that SMEs in the region can adapt. The end goal is to develop a quality seaweed product that have a consistent standard, are identifiable and that can be clearly branded. So in order to achieve our objective, we have three main areas of work plans. So they are DNA tagging, cultivation, sustainability and branding. I'll go into a little bit more depth about the DNA tagging and the other ones too. So with DNA tagging, our project and partner in NUI Galway are leading this. Their aim is to create a DNA database of all of the seaweed or of two strains of seaweed, which is Palmaria palmata and Saccharina in the NPA region. Here is the NPA region map for reference. So they are taking fresh samples from various locations around the NPA and are undergoing G DNA testing in order to establish their genome sequence. As well as that, they will be creating a DNA testing kit that SMEs can send their, project, their samples to, to confirm the origin or sometimes the species of um, of the seaweed. As well as that, we're looking at the sustainability within the seaweed industry. We have a focus on renewable and heat recovery systems in the drying processes of seaweed. 
As well as that, we're looking at a new project around a shared infrastructure system. So really the idea here is a more cost effective method of drying for small companies. It takes an awful lot of investment for SMEs to invest in drying infrastructure. So the idea behind this it is a shared system where multiple SMEs can use in order to be cost effective and to facilitate cooperation as well. Um, as well as that, we're looking at the waste to fuel, so the pelletization of seaweeds for a CHP system, which is led by our partners in Iceland. As well as that, there is a cultivation work package where our project partner in Tari or Tari in the Faroe Islands is leading. So the idea behind this is that there will be a handbook of best practice for cultivating Palmeria palmata and Saccharina latisma. And finally, the branding aspect of SW Grow. The end aim of this will is that we'll have a brand or a stamp of approval for NPA seaweed. So this will stand for a high quality product in terms of nutritional aspect and organoleptic, as well as a confirmed origin and that the seaweed products are produced within sustainable um, methodologies. So with this project, there's a strong industry focus and in trying to help them increase their economic opportunities. Here is just a quick example of some of the, the seaweed companies that we are dealing with in Ireland. And here is an overview of our project partners. So we have Roy from Lewis Castle College here today with us and many of our partners are as attendees here too give you an overview of some of the work that has been carried out for the past couple of months um, we had a seminar family which is Irish for seaweed a seaweed seminar in January before Covid was an issue and you can see there was a large crowd in attendance the main focus was to look at the Irish seaweed industry communicate the benefits of SW Grow as well as gaining an insight into what the industry needs and support from from state agencies and what we can we can help with. As well as that we have gone through our first trial or growth stage of cultivation. Um, Roy has his first research paper under SW Grow and of course today's event too. Um, an important factor of this project is our seaweed survey, which is active and live at the moment. It would be fantastic if we could get some, some responses from some of our participants today. We aim, this is really aimed at the industry, looking at growers, pro producers and processors. We want to understand the energy usage, the cultivation versus wild harvesting, your harvesting methodologies and production. And this will all be quite private and you do not need to assign your business name. So don't worry about that. However, the results will be open access to everyone. So if you wish to get a copy of the results, just pop me an email. So that's it from me today. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Roy, who will talk about his latest um, paper. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them in the Q&A section here. Or if you wish to talk about the project in more detail, you can send me an email. Thank you. Roy, over to you. Good morning. Excellent. Right. Well, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Roy Bartle and I sit here in the Department of Engineering at Lewis Castle College in the uh, sunny Outer Hebrides, where we ostensibly spearhead the developments in seaweed drying. And I hope to speak to you just for five minutes about three things. Firstly, to ask the question, what is optimal seaweed drying? Secondly, to give you a very brief overview of what we are doing to advance seaweed drying. And thirdly, to look in more detail at one aspect of the work that we've done over the past few months. So firstly, then, uh, optimal seaweed drying. And one wonders whether the word optimal perhaps is a misnomer. Because if you're a, a seaweed producer, then you will score the success of your seaweed drying method on several factors. It could be the nutritional characteristics of the end product, how that product looks, how quickly it, it, it um, dries how sustainable the process is, how much you have to spend to obtain the equipment, 
Um, scalability. So if you're a seaweed producer and you start off producing half a ton a day, and over the course of some months end up producing several tons a day, will you find that you need to buy a new piece of equipment or will your seaweed drying system work? And there are two things associated with this. The first thing that we, we ought to note is that there is no perfect solution. Uh, different uh, solutions have different advantages and disadvantages. And that's related to the second thing, which is that different producers place different emphases on different aspects of any kind of drying system. So for example, you might be looking at the high end of the market and therefore product aesthetics are very important, or you might be just starting out and not have a lot of money to spend on initial expenditure. And so a low initial system price is very important. The reason I mention all of this is just to say that our philosophy in, um, in the drying sector of the SW Grow program is not to produce blanket statements of what is right and what is wrong, but rather to elucidate different aspects of seaweed drying, to understand them better, and then to convey what we've learned to producers and others in the community so that they in turn can make informed decisions when it comes to seaweed drying. Secondly, I thought to give you a very, very brief overview of what we uh, in um, Lewis Castle College UHI are doing to uh, advance seaweed drying. And broadly speaking, there are two strands to our work. There is a, a seaweed drying fundamentals strand, which is looking at, in detail at the different aspects that uh, affect the drying of seaweed and indeed of other materials. And then there's also an energy systems for drying aspect, which takes the drying system now instead as a black box and looks at uh, the energy systems that are required around it. For example, how can seaweed drying be incorporated into a renewable energy system using wind or solar? Or as we have a pilot in the Faroes with uh, tarry seaweed, a hydro turbine system. Now we've already published uh, earlier in the year at the Arctic Frontiers Conference in Tromso, some work on the energy system side so I thought it'd be more interesting for you uh, if we focused in the remainder of this presentation on some work we've done on the left-hand side in seaweed drying fundamentals, and in particular in natural convection drying kinetics. Now, these are the two uh, seaweed species that we have been looking at, Laria sculenta and Palmeria palmata, and you may well know them by other names. We asked two questions. The first question is, how does air temperature affect drying time in natural convective drying? And the answer is, uh, if you look at these two graphs with time on the x-axis in log scale and moisture ratio on the y-axis, uh, where a moisture ratio of one is wet seaweed, as it were, as it comes out of the sea and zero is fully dry. What we found was that for both species, increasing the air temperature, the air drying temperature from 40 degrees to 70 degrees, decreased the drying time in both species to about six, by about 60%, which is quite considerable. Now, speaking to people uh, in the seaweed industry, anecdotally, there seems to be this assumption that increasing drying temperature has an adverse or disadvantageous effect on the nutritional properties of seaweed. Now, that's not something that we have uh, been able to address directly. But the vast bulk of literature that's been published shows either no effect on drying temperature on seaweed nutrition, or indeed a positive effect. That is that increasing the drying temperature actually helps preserve some of the nutrients in the seaweed. And the suggestion is that it, because the drying time is shorter, so there's less opportunity for nutrition to leach out. That of course only works up to a certain level. If you start burning the substance, then you lose all of the nutritional properties. The second question we asked was, how dry does the dry seaweed need to be when stored? Because it's certainly the case that with some foodstuffs like grain, the material does not need to be fully dried. And drying something more than is necessary wastes energy, which is a disadvantage to the environment and it costs money. Now, the, the magic figure is a wa water activity of under 0.61. We don't have time to define what water activity is, but just remember this figure. Water activity of under 6, 0.61 inhibits microbial growth in any foodstuff. And what we found was for, for both our seaweeds, if you see uh, the, these graphs show water activity on the x-axis and uh, a weight ratio on the y-axis, 
that there are almost no points where water activity is not totally dry, so it's not zero on the y-axis, but is under 0.61 on the x-axis. And in layman's terms, what this means is that producers need to make sure that when they are drying their seaweed, that the seaweed is fully dry. And for our purposes, we define fully dry as if the sample declined in weight by less than 10 to the minus five grams per minute for five minutes. In other words, you need to be sure that there is no change in weight with time for the seaweed to be totally dry. Otherwise, the seaweed will start to spoil when it's stored. Now that has taken up all the time. For more information, you might like to look at our papers or uh, drop me an email, or perhaps you have questions that uh, you might intend to raise over the next few hours. Thank you very much. Um, there we go. <laughs> I'm back again. It's a great work, uh, Roy and Kiana. I don't see anyone has um, any questions. Do you have some questions that you want to ask Kiana or, and Roy now? Um, I'm very interested in um, Roy's paper and uh, really looking forward to um, when they're going to publish that. Um, and you might just give us maybe um, an email us all, maybe a summary beforehand. But um, does anyone at all have any questions for these guys? Or will we straight, go straight into the um, sustainable seaweed herb standard? Um, I'm just th thinking there, and I was laughing to myself. Were, was any of you guys logged in earlier to the BIM seminar? Um, I was personally <laughs> laughing when um, Dave was talking about seaweed as his bedtime reading. Um, I was glad to hear that I'm not the only person who finds seaweed so interesting. So um, next up, we have another Dave, Dave Garford. Dave is a senior consultant with RS Standards and is probably known to many of you, um, especially in the seafood sector, as he has over 25 years experience in auditing, research, training, fish feed and standard development. But just remember guys, today is, today is for you, the farmers, the harvesters, the producers and policy makers. So make sure to ask as much questions as you need answered. And if we don't get to them all, um, we'll be sure to follow up. So um, Dave, I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much, Maura. Well, good morning, everyone, and perhaps good afternoon and good evening for some of you as well. Um, First, very, very much like to thank um, Moira and her colleagues for inviting me to present to you this morning um, under the Seagrow project. Um, I've been asked if I could sort of like explore uh, the world of standards and certi certification vis-a-vis uh, -vis sustainability and how they might apply to uh, seaweed. Um, so what I've got here is a, a sort of like a, a mishmash of the different types of standards which could be interesting to you all uh, and, and, and those in the project. Um, and I'm trying to give a bit of a snapshot, a bit of a, a background and understanding of each one of them. Now, as, as Moira said, um, well, first of all, I'd like to sort of acknowledge that I, I know I'm sitting among some eminent scientists and experts in seaweed and practitioners too. Uh, so it, it will be great actually if, um, if you could respond with questions, comments, be happy to so like stop through the, the the presentation I'm giving and and pause and and have a, have have comments and, and try and respond to those comments. Um, <clears throat> I, I know it's not exactly a classroom we're in, but uh, we'll try and so like make it as interactive as possible. And I think more is going to help me out here as chats come through if I miss them, and I'll try and stop and and respond to them. Okay, um, let me just put up my screen. And we can take a start. Now, if, I, if I'm kind of looking in a slightly different direction, it's because I've got a second screen. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but I'll, I'll try and keep look, looking at you as well. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that screen's up. Uh, Maura is going to tell me if it's not, but I'll continue. Uh, sustainable seaweed harvesting standards. Yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Maura. My name is Dave Garforth. Um, I work for a consultancy called RS Standards. Um, and RS Standards is engaged. I'll take the next slide if I can. Ah, 
I will. Uh, we're a service company, yeah. So we're, we're engaged a lot around the seafood arena, um, working globally. Um, and, and I guess it, if, if we wanted to sort of like coin in, in, in a simple way, what, what we try and support businesses uh, and other programs do is to help better develop better practices for responsibly source seafood and, the, and, the, and then obviously supplied safely to markets and hopefully leading to improved livelihoods and benefits uh, to communities uh, where, where aquaculture and where fisheries and seafood producers exist. Um, the logos below just give us give you some understanding of the types of organizations and programs we work with. Um, so things like Global Seafood Assurances, which is a program uh, which has invested a lot of time over the last two or three years in developing social accountability standards um, for fishing in particular, um, and other standards around best practice for fishing and some relating to aquaculture. Um, some of these are global standards, some of them are regional standards in different parts of the world, uh, such as Alaska, for example, and responsible fishing, fishing standards um, in, in that particular location, and closer to home, working here with the state bodies BIM and, and also with UDROS on their own programming, if you wish, and there are national standards available for seafood here in Ireland, for example. So, and it's a common thing that uh, nationally and internationally uh, standards uh, have been developed um, for different reasons. And we're going to sort of like explore some of those different reasons. So quick snapshot then of what I'm going to speak about. Um, a quick look at global seafood production. I think most of you probably have that, so I'll keep it quite brief, but it's just a scene setter. Um, then I'm going to talk about standards and certification, just in terms of the whole reasoning and the, of having voluntary standards in operation. What are, the, what are they designed to do and how do they articulate? Then we'll take a look at the standards for seaweed. Um, and I've sort of done a review of the available options um, and a snapshot of each one. Um, with uh, which, which may be of, of interest to you. Uh, we're going to take a look at traceability too, just cl closing up, and maybe then, again, if, if we can have feedback, it would be interesting to, to get your comments on what choices you think are, are, are most suitable for your own needs. Um, I'm just mentioning there in brackets, uh, some of the materials I'm, uh, I'm citing are from a lot of the standards bodies, which uh, particularly the ones which have um, standards for seaweed. I think I can see a number of comments coming in and I'll try and just pick those up. You're all good at the moment, Dave. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the previous ones, that's fine. Thank you. Well, let's start with this, sustainability. Uh, since we're talking about sustainable harvesting practices and sustainability throughout, um, and it might be worth, and you may have done it in the project, having a pause for thought about what definition you, you, you have made on this word sustainability. Um, since it's quite a, a, a long, um, well, it can be quite a long conversation, I think, for a better way of putting it. Um, and, and what I put up there is just sort of the, a basic nuts and bolts sustainability uh, definition, which you, you would find in many different places, um, just, to, just to set the scene, you know, in terms of sustain sustainability means meeting our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own. And I think everybody's probably familiar with that sentence. And, and, and then it may go on to say things like, in addition to natural resources, because a lot of sustainability themes, particularly in seafood production, we think of natural resources, uh, but we, did, we could also consider social settings and social resources and also economic resources in that regard. And as you start to explore that, that particular uh, word, sustainability, it becomes ever and ever more complex um, or can, can do as well in terms of the amount of scope and, and interest you want to focus on um, when you start to look at certainly in sustainability and standards and certification. So yeah, it becomes a little bit more complex and it's worth probably considering, I think, yeah, just what definition you may want to consider when you think about sustainable harvesting as well, because different standards may have different levels and complements with them uh, around the criteria which cover 
the, the, nat the natural resources which seaweed requires um, and harvesting from that and the, the environmental impacts of those, but also considering the social setting, uh, communities where seaweed is harvested from, and also the economic resources which are included in that as well. And more and more today, we're moving, a, not away, but we're also linking sustainability with something called circular economy. And it's probably something, again, you're familiar with and you speak about within your own project themes as well and circularity being conservation of resources. So we're moving away from linear systems where resources uh, are the, or the end fate of resources waste. And waste is quite wasteful by de definition. Uh, it's really about trying to avoid waste and of course using uh, resources. So this notion of circularity. So global seaweed. Um, this is from FAO uh, SOFIA report 2020 uh, from figures from 2018. So global production is around 32 million uh, tons according to the FAO. Uh, comes from both farmed and harvested uh, um, origins, of course. Uh, the vast majority, and you're aware of this, I know, comes from farmed sources, about 97%, according to that FAO report. Um, and of course, we know that the major producers of seaweed are from East and Southeast Asia species, yes, yeah, Saccharina, Udaria, Eukemia, uh, et cetera, Glossiaria. Um, and you're all familiar with these things. Uh, systems, yeah, a whole range of different systems for producing seaweed from longline systems, rafts, uh, nearshore systems, offshore systems. Um, and, yeah, I'm just putting a couple of points in terms of this comes up in, uh, uh, from time to time in terms of the value of having seaweed production systems in their ability to sequester, uh, sequester carbon, of course, being one of those things. Um, and of course, on the negative side, potential to be overexploited and impact habitats and ecosystems since they are such keystone features of e ecosystems and habitats. Okay, again, I don't intend to go through this in any detail, but just of course, in the major producers, China by far, uh, I think we're aware of that, is the, the largest producer of seaweeds. Uh, uh, the vast majority, again, from farm sources, about 18 and a half million tonnes, according to FAO, in 2018, followed by Indonesia, but, uh, but producing half of that, but still very significant when you compare to the, the drop off in the tail there uh, on the, in the rest of production. Um, so, of course, China has vast resources in, in marine resources, so on, on, there are opportunities there. But uh, I, I think, of course, it does pause us to consider the again the opportunity for seaweed production in the coastlines and many other regions of the world um, if we can develop it in a responsible and sustainable manner this is a uh, yeah pictures from china um I had the opportunity to go out there it's probably two years ago now actually and look at some seaweed operations as well as other species abalone actually we were looking at this is uh, out near jamen uh, just north of that um, and those of you who are either from there or, or, or indeed uh, have visited will probably understand and recognize the scale um, of, of seaweed uh, farming in these regions. It, it is quite incredible to see. And of course, all the value added products that, that come from that as well um, in seaweed production. This is one of the factories I visited. It is, it is of a, a considerable scale. I think they, were, they employed maybe 450, 500 people in this facility. Um, I even forget the actual output in terms of production figures, uh, but certainly large industrial scale processing, very labor intensive operations in these regions, um, both at the farm and also the harvesting, the processing side, and of course leading to a quite a wide range of well-developed consumer products um, in these regions. Uh, but again, I'm hinting at the opportunity, of course, in, in other regions to develop and grow such a diverse level of products and, and offerings. Closer to home here than in Ireland, okay, and we know that Ireland has, has a long uh, and significant history, I think, with seaweed in, in terms of communities um, in Ireland. Um, and these are just some points I'm raising, 18th century, we, we were using kelp ash in glass manufacturing um, and of course as a source of iodine, um, moving quickly to modern, more modern times, uh, alginate extraction with a wide range of applications for food, for pharmaceutical, increasingly more in biomedical and in, and in textiles and I'm sure your projects are looking at these things in, in detail um, and then significant so like um, establishments such as RMRHO 
in seaweed production, um, long established, and they're probably listening to me now since 1947, if I've got the facts correct. Um, and of course, utilize a large resource of seaweed available on the west coast of Ireland. So making significant, significant contributions in that regard. Um, the figures I have is around about 40,000 tonnes of seaweed in, in, uh, is harvested annually from the, from the wild anyway, from cut seaweeds, uh, Escophyllum, uh, Nonsum being a predominant one, uh, but um, among others as well. And I think in probably your BIM workshop has been exploring uh, the out outcomes from the other work that's happening in Ireland in terms of R&D and there's some, I think, significant and, and interesting work being done uh, around things like red seaweeds, for example, and looking at these newer um, or not newer species, but may maybe newer species for cultivation, but maybe offering um, a good opportunity in terms of the economic opportunity of marketing. Yeah, and so leading to, to yeah, quite, quite a, uh, if, if small, but I think diverse uh, and, and, and developing uh, seaweed processing and value added sector, uh, which is very interesting to see and, and well, fantastic to see really here in Ireland, you know, with, yeah, and also including some major brands in seaweed products um, for things like soil conditioners, um, agri feeds, etc., and then the more so like specialist products in for human consumption and use, uh, and perhaps some some new stuff which is not up here as well in terms of bio and, and pharm pharmaceutical applications. Um, I've just put the seaweed site there. You probably all know it as an information on marine algae. It's a fantastic resource. Um, for people to so like uh, get a snapshot of what's happening here in Ireland, but also around the world as well. So moving to standards and certification. Um, so what do they do? They generally prescribe best practice in something or good practice in something or responsible practice in something. Um, they often try and identify the challenges or the activities that prevent negative impacts. Um, and there could be negative impacts on, on many different aspects of production or very different aspects of the actual product itself. So quality, of course, being a significant part of that. And a lot of the original set of standards that we had maybe, if you wind the clock back 20 or 25 years ago, pretty much focused on quality attributes and quality systems. And in the world of food, food safety, of course, as well, being an important part of that. Um, I think as standards have evolved and progressed and as the language has changed and our understanding of about impacts environment became uh, a, a more considered um, area for standardization uh, and then moving forward again this these things about social uh, accountability health and safety even as well included in that uh, have become sort of like a part and parcel of the sustainability conversation if you wish um, and part and parcel of standards Standards in the voluntary set usually go beyond legal compliance. So they take legal compliance and build upon it. And legal compliance usually becomes a reference, um, a foundation to them. Um, so they can be regulatory though. Um, you can obviously we have regulatory standards in place, but most of course are, are, are voluntary in terms of the interesting ones which we're looking at. Um, and they can be considered in two levels. One is a business to business approach and one is a business to consumer approach. And that tends to define whether the standard and the certification leads to some type of a claim or some type of logo, some type of recognition on the actual product itself, which is visible in front of the consumer. So consumers can make an informed choice um, about taking a product which might be certified to a set of attributes or, or may not be uh, certified. Just checking if there's questions coming in here. Everyone is just super quiet today, Dave. So, sorry, I know. I just thought I saw it. And maybe the old one's coming back up again. Apologize. Um, yeah. I, I'll move on. Um, so, yeah, so standards use something called third party certification. And this gives independent verification 
to a what would have otherwise been either a first party claim as in the business making a claim itself that hey we're sustainable um, or a second party claim could be that one of its uh, customers or stakeholders makes a statement saying they're sustainable so you should trust those guys or the third level which is what i'm talking about today is through a formal certification process by an independent uh, organization which is established to do just that and offer an independent objective uh, um, statement about whether a business or an applicant meets a set of criteria vis-a-vis -vis sustainability we're talking today um, so where, where, where does the so like the power the authority come from and, and this voluntary set of standards and certification and why should we so like be interested in, in them but well, it really comes from not from governments or regulations but it comes from the marketplace so businesses choose voluntary standards because they see that there is an interest in the marketplace either from the supply chain or directly to their customer base the consumers who have an interest in in having a certain set of attributes displayed in a product and visibly measured against that and that's really where the so like the, the the power of certification comes from so it gives a market incentive for a producer to comply with standards basically and become certified and if um, it just was to try and put up in a in a picture sense uh, how the different elements of standards and certification work. There's a number of so like different entities which are at play, and I'm sure some of you will be aware of this. So, at the so like at the top, you have some something called a program owner or a standards body. So the entity that owns the standard and um, puts that standard up for use, if you wish, within a certain sector. Um, okay, we're talking about seafood in this today. Uh, and specifically, we're talking about seaweed um, and standards bodies, for example, which are doing just this. Examples will be the Marine Stewardship Council. And I'm going to be speaking about the Marine Stewardship Council's uh, standards uh, a little bit later. And also things like the Irish Organic Association's standard for organic uh, farming, which also includes seaweed. So I'm just giving you two examples there. So they're program owners or standards bodies. Um, Underneath that or alongside it, you have these things called certification bodies and different programs may refer to them as different things. CBs, certification bodies or, or CABs, com conformity assessment bodies is a, another term which is often used. So these are the entities that actually take the standard and offer it into a marketplace and measure that those particular applicants in that marketplace against those standards. Two examples, SAI Global, I have an office here in Ireland. That's my background. I've spent 13 years with SAI Global, uh, working in the seafood space globally and offering standards and certification and working with different assessment teams and, uh, and different clients in, in seafood. And another one, Lloyd's Register, a really quite a large um, assurance body working globally. So certification bodies at the checkers. Uh, are the independent checkers. Then, of course, you have the applicants, and some of you sit here today may be the applicants. Um, so the, the entities that are interested in getting certified, you know, and can range from anything from a group of, of producers uh, doing, a, doing one thing in an area, uh, such as seaweed harvesting, uh, a vessel, for example, yeah, from, from my picture, or a fishery. So in a fishery, so like of course, is a no, includes a number of things, fishing vessels, uh, participants, uh, management system around it, um, you know, and the stakeholders as well. Um, so, so the entity which gets certified um, can, can change depending on the focus of each of these standards. To the right, I put this thing around called accreditation bodies, and probably some of you are, are familiar with the Irish National Accreditation Board. So accreditation bodies tend to sit uh, above uh, programs and certification bodies and administer a number of standards themselves, which define how standards and certification should be administered so that they remain credible, robust, transparent and consistent. Um, so that they deliver so like the value at the end at the end of the day and some of those standards will be things like ISO 17021 and 17065 which some of you may be familiar with and there are others codes of practice such as ISEAL um, which is the International Social and Environmental, Environmental Alliance who uh, is an international body which has set a code of practice of if anybody wants to go about defining standards which cover the social and the environmental space, sustainability in many respects, then here's a code of practice of how you should go about it. 
and it really defines how to create standards which are transparent, which have multi-stakeholder um, involvement in them and, uh, and, and deliver uh, positive outcomes and benefits in terms of their intended objectives around sustainability themes. And accreditation bodies, what they do is check that certification bodies are applying the program standards and requirements in that consistent and credible way. And by doing so, they give them something called an accreditation. What it means is that the certificate the certification bodies give become accredited certificates and accredited certificates are of value because they have greater recognition on a global basis. You see these accreditation bodies tend to work within an international accreditation forum, which is a global mutually recognized entity. So when they offer their accreditation and that gets so like transferred to a certificate, the certificate becomes more relevant in international markets. So it does have a lot of value in having accreditation around standards and certification. Okay, a little bit closer to home then, international standards in fisheries and aquaculture. So there's a number of different standards bodies which are, are being created over the years where, who are in the seafood space um, and in the aquaculture space as well. And these are just some of them, not all of them, but the, kind of the key international ones. Uh, GA Global Aquaculture Alliance has a program called Best Aquaculture Practices, which is indeed as a comprehensive set of best practice aquaculture standards. Uh, covering lots of different species, feed, biosecurity management, processing. Um, they don't include seaweed at this point in time. Um, uh, the next one is uh, Global Gap, I mentioned here. They have an integrated aquaculture standard um, and then subsets for different species and indeed does include seaweed. Um, then the other two here, which are put close together, ASC, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, um, and Marine Stewardship Council, I forgot to put a little bullet point up for them, um, they oper both operate at, at, at different standards, Aqu uh, for ASC of course operating aquaculture standards and a number of different comprehensive standards uh, which are very species specific and Marine Stewardship Council operate a global standard for sustainable fishing and something called a chain of custody standard as well I'll speak about. Um, and these guys came together to create a seaweed standard and I'm going to focus on that during the, uh, the conversation today. And then we have a set of organic standards as well, organic farming standards, which are sort of like, you know, primarily or originally focused on agriculture, um, but then moved into aquaculture and by virtue of that moved into seaweed and includes wild harvesting seaweed as well as uh, farmed seaweed as well. So and I think probably people listening today are familiar with these standards and may indeed be certified to them. Probably the more most active use of standards and certification today in seaweed. So here's a, it looks like a busy slide, I know, but I uh, said so just putting up some pictures um, of, of those standards which are operating around seaweed. So on the left, this is the one I just mentioned, ASC and MSC came together and created a seaweed standard. I put Global Gap here in that integrated aquaculture standard, so not specifically to seaweed, but have an annex related to seaweed components and then the general standard. Um, and then this set on the right is a sort of like the set of the organic standards. Um, which are defined under an EU regulation. Uh, and the current EU regulation is 834-2007. However, this will be replaced very soon by a new one, which was formed in 2018. Um, so it's a new, a new regulation covering all uh, organic um, agricultural systems in Europe, including aquaculture and including seaweed, um, which will be coming into place. Well, actually it's delayed. So we think probably 2022 now. Uh, it was originally intended to be in place January 2021. Uh, it's probably COVID uh, or the impact of COVID causing that. Um, and some of the, and so these regulations have been transcribed into national standards and these are the Irish set here. It's basically the same standard, but there's two different standards bodies operating it. Um, and then you've probably heard of other standards bodies such as the Soil Association and Organic operating in the UK. Um, and then in other standards, private label standards such as Natureland in Germany, but very much operating internationally. And Natureland I put up because they kind of came in was one of the original private label organic standards bodies to start to prescribe organic requirements for aquaculture, particularly around salmon. And that started in Ireland, actually in Clare and Sea Farms back in the early 90s. I'm checking for questions, guys. 
Ah. Uh, do any EU countries have national seaweed, seaweed accreditations? Um, national seaweed accreditations. Not, 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 not in the sense that there's a, a separate accreditation specific for seaweed, as far as I'm, I'm aware. Um, but certainly, I'm, I'm talking around, of course, the organic, so like part, part components now, standards and certifications. Um, that they would be; these would be formal European standards, of course, recognised through that Euro, European regulation. Um, and the, the, their authority actually is quite is a little bit different because it's a regulation than the other voluntary set. Uh, in that if you do, do decide to opt for the European regulation-based organic standards, whilst you voluntarily take that decision, once you're operating to those requirements, it is a regulation. So there are there are there are laws around that in terms of how you operate, particularly in using this logo here, the EU organic leaf. Uh, so there's strict rules about what you can and can't do with that. Um, in, in that sense, there there are in the other set as well, but uh, maybe not defined by regulation is really what I'm saying. Uh, the question I'll take a look. I'd like to discuss the cost and value of the standard certification for companies. Okay, so <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's a it's a day's work. Um, th there's I, I guess if I put it in simple sense, certainly there's different price points. It's probably a simple way to put it for engaging with these different types of standards and certification programs. Um, uh, 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 and there's different endpoints in terms of what the value proposition is and what they may or may not do for you. Um, it's very much, I think, driven by your own needs and your own market needs uh, and interests as well. And it could also relate to capability. Uh, some of these standards I'm gonna speak about today are extremely comprehensive. Um, could be considered as being challenging to meet. Um, and what I would suggest is you do not enter them without a lot of thought and a lot of um, a, a lot of pre-planning um, in, in terms of how you would go about achieving the requirements. And I would even suggest some of them are more about creating a journey towards achieving certification. But once there, you may find that the journey is very rewarding in being able to a demonstrate a course in your marketplace and, to, and among your stakeholders that you hit some of the, the so like the gold standards in sustainability as prescribed by these standards and secondly by taking the journey may have you know created some some positives taking some positive steps and improvements in the way that seaweed in in your business or within that location has been managed so it's it's a com it's an easy question. It's a complex answer, um, and and really I think defined by each individual company. I'm going to sort of like touch upon that particular question as we work through it, just in terms of a question mark. And again, I'll I'll pause and take any comments and thoughts. Dave, can you hear me there? Yeah. Yes, I can. Hi, Dave. Mark White here. Um, so I. I, I I think this is a question that's very important and I'm conscious that um, there's a lot of, of companies, seaweed companies on here um, and, and people look at standards in a way as a holy grail, but when you actually get into it, it, it can be something of a, of a nightmare for small companies. And, and I say that as somebody who spent most of my own working life in the private sector, um, I was, um, in the weather forecasting business for the oil and gas sector, which is quite highly regulated, and where ISO 9000 or varieties of the ISO standards were, were all over the place, uh, and where there was quite a number of um, programs in different markets that were that created huge barriers for entry to those markets and required mm -hmm. you to get approved, but to pay money for approval for one form of certification or another, uh, and thereafter that you had access to that market. And, and one of the issues for, for small companies in looking at this relative plethora of marks that you're referring to here, Dave, is that each and every one of those marks has a certification process, and most of them will have a cost associated with the process of certifying, 
but it, also the cost of, of joining the certification. And there has to be, I think, a close look taken at the cost versus the value. So if you think about the organic salmon guys, there is a huge premium for having certified organic salmon in the marketplace. I mean, the premium from, from the lowest price ordinary or, uh, farm salmon to organic salmon is, is pretty much 100%. And therefore the cost of implementing an organic salmon process and the cost of implementing the organic salmon certification is a no brainer. In seaweed, where the markets are smaller uh, and developing, I think there's going to have to be quite a lot of thought given to how to do a certification that provides real value to the operating companies. And if we're going to do something around, for example, uh, an origin green type thing, a seaweed from Ireland piece, then in looking at the prices that we can sell our products in the markets, we have to find a way of making sure that the seaweed from Ireland gets a premium, which supports the cost of running that brand. And so I think that as we talk about standards, we've also got to think very, very carefully about what the value is to our companies uh, and to Ireland Inc. In, in putting it in that way. And that means we've got to, companies got to think about these um, certification activities very, very closely along with their branding and market differentiation activities that allow them to get extra value for money. And that without doing that, um, certification for certification's sake can actually become a fatal instrument and not a helpful one. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think valid points, you know, and, and there is, I'm probably going to, have to like come to it a little bit later on. So certainly the, the, the choice has to, has to be a business decision. So, it, and it has to make sense for the business in, in that regard. And as you said, offer an opportunity, there has to be a value proposition in it. And, um, you know, and, and it, it is true to say that some of these standards bodies that I might be presenting, they 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 are very effective in 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 their own in their own so sort of like way that they engage in the so sort of like seafood market, um, and by engaging in the seafood market, they do of course create um, an interest in 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 their their standards and their programs because uh, they're in, they're interested in creating influence and pull. Um, and, it, and it's to, you know you raise the point in terms of does that ultimately though become a barrier for others to entry? It's it's a it's a valid point, and it, I know it's been raised uh, many times. Um, and you know on the on the other side, I know that the, the standards as well are conscious of that, and they, and they do try to uh, create new processes and try to create new you know to accommodate let's say smaller producers so that the cost of entry into these programs is not as pro prohibitive maybe there's more work to be done I'll, I'll admit that as well um, and, and maybe again as you said well not maybe it's true to say I think every individual producer you know or collective if you want to put it in that sense needs to probably just sit down and say well, what do we want to feature here we, we, you know, in terms of why, why, we, why do we see that an independent so like certification can be of value to us? What do we want to feature within that? And do the standards today offer so like those those communication points to be made in a in a succinct you know and, and valuable way that obviously creates market opportunity or answers a market need that that uh, secures a market. So yeah, so thanks very much. Yeah. Slide. This, this slide was so like by way of just trying to segment what these standards do um, by, by major focus, if you wish. Um, um, so what do they include and what don't they include? And to some extent, trying to sort of consider how you might rationalize or which choices do we make or do we make are these choices, any of these choices suitable for us? Um, and that may change over time as well. So I'm just segmenting the organic set of standards, uh, the global gap um, standard 
standard I mentioned and the ASC MSC seaweed standard. Um, and I've just put some titles up at the top there. You can see, let me see my mouse here. Um, what is their identity? What are they really focusing on? Well, some of it's common sense, organic, it's an organic label. Um, you're selling an organic product, which is, does have a value proposition. Um, Global Gap is really about demonstration of good aquaculture practice. And the ASC, MSC seaweed standard provides an eco label, that, that blue label of greeny blue label for ASC, uh, which gives a definition of the product in the marketplace. Um, do they cover both wild and farm? I'm sort of saying next. And I put a question mark on Global Gap um, of whether they cover wild. They, they, they don't have a lot of activity in seaweed certification. Um, I, I asked the question actually, I was waiting for them to come back to me. I just wanted to be sure uh, of whether they would allow wild seaweed harvesting and then that, that moving forward into processing and becoming certified. But uh, I'll update that one uh, as I get that information. And then so like the key focuses which they cover, so sustainable stocks, so, so like a convenient way of sort of saying, you know, are we harvesting sustainably, is the stock being maintained sufficiently? Um, yes, they all have elements of that. Environmental impact, do they consider what impacts that activity of harvesting might have on, on the environment? Yes, they all cover that. What about this thing about social and social accountability? Um, within the so like the standard and, and, and the workforce basically um, in terms of social welfare. Well, not all of them really have so like pres prescribed criteria covering the social accountability part. Um, and that may or may not be in, of interest. Um, and I put a little com comment here on number two. Oh, this is by a GRASP standard for global gap. So they bolt on another audit, in other words, during that audit phase of, of the assessment. Um, food MS, food management systems, do, we, do which and to what extent might they cover food management systems, of course, because we're selling food or producing food uh, a lot of times when we're looking at seaweed, and that might be important for some businesses. Um, but the organic ones do in terms of they have uh, that you're selling organic quality. So the food, the system is really an organic food system. Um, but in terms of how prescriptive it is on that, the organic standards aren't that terribly prescriptive really around actual food management systems when you compare to other uh, food, uh, food systems and standards, but maybe suitable. Um, and here on Global Gap, um, they do cover uh, food management systems to a high degree actually, um, and it really is about protecting product integrity. Uh, food safety, uh, which ones might cover elements of food safety, where well, the organic is so like based on the legal requirements for food safety anyway. So by virtue of that, it does. Uh, Global Gap does cover ex uh, expansively in terms of food safety criteria. Uh, the ASC and MSC standards don't really move into that space of food safety, nor are food management systems. These standards are more about the product in the water and how they're managed in the water. Once they're taken out of the water, they cover traceability. I didn't put that one up, but they all do anyway. Um, but not so much around these two particular uh, key areas. Health and safety, uh, arguably connected to social welfare and, and the workplace. Um, some, some do, and some do to a greater or lesser de degree. Um, and the organic sets don't really, um, other than I could have put legal there as well, because there's always a legal basis under the organic ones. Uh, and then this notion of community, do any of them com consider how seaweed harvesting, seaweed production impacts or contributes to the local community? Uh, and a, a lot of them really talk about access, do they restrict access to this, so like the uh, coastal environments by virtue of them being there and to what extent that might happen or are there other impacts on the community? So a lot of these standards are very much focused on impacts and criteria to prevent, reduce, and mitigate from impact. And again, uh, two of them do, Global Gap and ASCMSC standards uh, do include clauses around community and community integration, where, whereas organic doesn't really to any extent. And traceability I mentioned here, they all have a, a requirement for traceability to back to source, because without that, of course, you wouldn't be able to put a definition, a logo on the product itself without securing and, and ensuring that, and most of them do it through something called a chain of custody certification, which again, I'm going to speak about briefly. So organic principles, a quick snapshot, then the first set, what are, what are the organic principles? 
um, th these are the sort of like the common principles which are taken at, 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 at the top of the organic regulation. So promoting the use of natural cycles, that goes for all farming systems that look at organic, promoting biodiversity, um, preventing impacts of, on biodiversity, um, and avoiding artificial and non-natural interventions. And of course, the organic set of standards are very much focused on natural cycles, not using any sort of like form of interventions, chemical treatments, and these type of things across all type of, of all the farm insects, as well as seaweed, um, and pro pro prohibiting the use of so like th those substances. Uh, GMOs also not allowed. Uh, under any of the organic standards for all the different applications and in animals no ploidy so no sex reversal uh, no triploid treatments as well uh, are allowed so natural cycles is sort of what they're promoting within the organic set and so maybe of use to seaweed and I think it's uh, yeah it's already been used so uh, I, I, th I think it's proven that, that the seaweed operations can meet these requirements um, and well, people can comment actually if they're part of a, a, an organic certification to these standards of, of what the value might be. So a number of control requirements for seaweed. So that they do have some detail in, in the organic standards and particularly around environmental effects and environmental impacts. Um, and they, they tend to draw, the, all, as I mentioned, the regulation for organic uh, uh, agricult agriculture and aquaculture tends to draw upon so like other regulations, and I'm just referencing here, environmental impact assessments under 85337, um, which again, some of you may be familiar with, if you've got farms that you've done, you've got to go through the EIS process or at least the screening process to that. Um, so they're drawing on things which you may already have done from a legal basis, thereby potentially reducing the barrier to entry into these types of standards, if that information already exists. Um, in open systems such as seaweed, there's a three-month conversion period allowed. For closed systems in tanks, it changes. It can, can, can be as up, all the way up to 12 months, depending on what's been used in that facility prior to that. Um, they require a sustainable management plan being developed by the business which is looking for certification, which considers the environmental effects, what type of monitoring they might be doing to mitigate from that and prevent them, uh, prevent environmental impacts. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and for wild seaweed, yeah, there's a, that you have to map out where the harvesting and collection areas are um, and continually update that. So these are the words they use. Harvesting shall be carried out in such a way that the amounts harvested do not cause a significant impact on the state of the aquatic environment. And measures shall be taken to ensure that seaweed can regenerate, such as harvest techniques, minimum sizes, age, reproductive cycles, uh, or sizes of remaining seaweed. Um, regulation includes farming, or wild harvesting, and processing. So it covers the regulation covers all all those steps, if you like, to, in the value chain. And for seaweed harvesting, they require a, at least a once-off biomass estimate um, undertaken at the beginning of the the assessment or be, beginning of the application. And this is just a snapshot and in growth in organic farming. So where is organic agriculture going in general? So this is not, of course, seaweed based or even aquaculture based. It's a general, so like stats uh, from 2018. Um, so yeah, so currently half of Europe's organic farmland is based in four countries. So you can see who's active in organic, Spain, France, Italy, Germany. And I'm, I'm kind of pulling that up because it gives you an understanding as well where maybe the interest in the market might be as well. Um, Spain uh, has the largest area under organic cultivation. So again, I'm really not speaking specifically to aquaculture because it's a much smaller subset, but in generally to organic agriculture. And 3%, 3.1% of Europe's farmland is currently uh, organic. Um, and in Europe, that's raising to or the European Union anyway, that's raising to 7.7%. There is a, a lot of ambition within the uh, within Brussels, I guess, in terms of uh, to, to in, increase the amount of farmland in particular under organic cultivation. Uh, so it's it is it is there are targets being set of what they want to achieve, uh, and it's it's growing quite quickly actually. Um, and that figure there at the end, 69% in the last decade. So it's probably as much an indication of the interest in the marketplace as it is anything else, I would suspect, uh, in that sense. You know, and if we were to look at aquaculture, uh, 
this was taken from a, a, a Umofa report of 2017. Um, gives you the key species here. Seaweed's not not mentioned, and there's such a small amount compared to other um, aquaculture uh, products. So it's probably the reason why um, it's not been included in the stats. But and and uh, no, this comment was made by by Mark there in terms of the price premium achieved on salmon and. The number here, 30-35% return, is, is probably understated actually, uh, which is a great thing. You know, and it's been fa fantastic for the Irish salmon industry to have an organic um, standard and certification um, program, which it can use to demonstrate how it differentiates itself in the marketplace and how it demonstrates that it is sustainable too. So it does, you know, in that sense, it's offered great value and opportunity. Um, in, in that sense. Trout to some extent too, as well, not so much here in terms of production, but in other countries, uh, in Denmark, um, a little bit in Sweden, Sweden and Finland as well. Here it's just itemizing as well, the additional cost side of that as well, and it's not a balanced equation, these are just percentages, so, um, but it's just sort of say, it's, you know, making that comment that th these are quite profitable things to be involved in um, for certain of these species. Um, and less so in other for other products, perhaps uh, looking at mussels at the bottom at the bottom, and a lot of the Irish in mussel industry is organically certified too, uh, but probably attracting a lesser premium in in that regard. But maybe on this side, of course, if you look at the extra costs, maybe so much extra costs involved in becoming organic, other than the cost of the audit, uh, maybe some documentation arrangements as well. So current uh, species, which are certified to organic standards, uh, and I took this courtesy at the B. Ims Farm and Seaweed Workshop in 2019, so it may have increased uh, or changed from that point. Um, but there is a, a, yeah, a range of species currently certified in, in uh, Ireland uh, to the organic standards. Uh, so there's a list there, I think it's probably eight or nine species that are there. Um, but again, I, I, I guess it's true to say, Organic aquaculture is a small subset of a segment which is small within the definition of, of food production. Um, so its impact, of course, is relative to that. It still may, may be offering support to the producers, um, certainly in terms of the value added products which are available in seaweed. So is it, is it an option for business? Um, it's very niche, I think is a, is a simple thing to say, but having said that, it is a well-defined market segment. So there is a definite market and it's growing for organic products. There are definite consumers who look and seek out organic products and will pay extra for that. So I think there is an, a, a business opportunity. It just needs to be identified and described and pursued in that sense. Uh, and I think I'll probably say in a later slide that no matter how much certification you, you may have in these voluntary standards for a product, it doesn't necessarily lead to a value proposition in the marketplace. And I think it's really about saying, if you don't have good control, your supply chains, uh, good connections in the marketplace uh, with, with, with your partners and your consumers and your customers, none of this may matter. It may be meaningless because uh, you know it's, everything else counts as well, in other words, in, in terms of marketing products. Seaweed for uh, differentiation and consumer connection, perhaps it does offer a, a value proposition for Irish seaweed and I'd be interested to hear any comments on that if people have them. Oh, one comment here. Um, do, uh, sorry, yeah, questions by uh, Andrew McKenzie. Do we, uh, do we need so many seaweed standards? Are they unjoined? So, okay. In, in the European set of seaweed standards are, are actually all joined by the European regulation. Uh, so you, you, they, they should be all very consistent in the way they're defined. It's just that the framework that which has been set up for administering those standards through the certification process or OCBs as they're called, organic control bodies, is country specific. And within each of those countries, those organic certification bodies have their own logos. So what you tend to find is that a lot of the products will carry this EU logo, 
which is that European regulation. Uh, and so that's the definite mark which says this comes from the European regulation. And so that's uh, probably the, the, the most useful or, or interesting one to, to when marketing so like into European countries. And then you, you may still want to carry the national logo because it could mean something in that marketplace. And some of these, of course, have got good reputations in themselves. And okay, Brat Soil Association, I mentioned earlier, you've all probably heard of Soil Association uh, because of its history. Um, it's been around for some quite some time, so has some brand value. So some companies may choose to say, we prefer to use Soil Association than another one. If they're illegally permitted, because there's sort of like boundaries in EU members of what you can, who you can and can't use, depending on what licenses they carry. Natureland is another one which carries a lot of brand value in certain markets, such as Germany, where they're from, but in other parts of the world too, actually, it's quite a well-recognized logo. So whilst there's one regulation that sits behind these to like private entities, uh, they all may offer some opportunity as well. Um, and then conversely, I know someone's probably saying, and maybe the comments made, made there by, by Andrew are about, well, will it confuse the marketplace? And there's always a risk that having a lot of these types of labels in the marketplace can lead to confusion and can lead to dilution of what the value of any of them are, you know, and so that can, so there is that concern as well. I'm going to move to the next one, Global Gap, Integrated Aquaculture. Um, so this is a, a, a best practice or a good a, a, a agriculture practice where it came from or aquaculture practice, we could say as well. It's an international standard setting body. It originates out of Europe, actually, something called Europe Gap, uh, was set up by supply chains in agriculture that wanted to ensure that the raw material supplies from cereal, from cereal and grains, actually, originally, uh, were consistent. Um, were risk-free in terms of certainly contaminants in, in, in that sector um, from pesticides, et cetera, and things like this. And so a set of standards were, were developed for that particular agriculture segment, and it's grown since then, over the years, since the early 80s, I think, um, all the way today. So now it include, they include a comprehensive set of aquaculture standards. From that original so uh, where they originated from, they maintained a strong focus on product safety, product integrity, product inte uh, yeah, and, and uh, seafood safety. Um, their scope, yeah, they cover everything from when the product, when the seed or the juveniles enter the farm, all the way through to the point of harvesting. Uh, then there are chain of custody standards as well for the processing environment and a processing standard. Um, based on control points and risk evaluation. So these standards are very much articulated about identifying risks and putting controls in place to mitigate from those risks. Um, I mentioned uh, environmental impact assessment on the organic set and similarly the global gap of a, a requirement for an environmental risk assessment. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is that if there is an interest in, in in global gap certification from someone who has uh, certified has been certified to organic certification it may not be a leap too far to move into this direction and it would give you other criteria that are included which you would thereby be able to demonstrate to your marketplace by having global gap and global gap particularly in europe is very much recognized by the european retailers um, and it can be a tick box for some of them for certain types of products so environmental impact, it's got like two sides to this. It covers so like, cause it's farm based. Uh, the, so like the impacts out of farms, such as effluents, uh, abstraction and use of water, even energy use is included, chemical management, emissions, and, and the potential to accidentally release the species. Um, what will that impact be? So very generic, of course, but you know, the, the subset would then make it applicable to seaweed standards. And then I mentioned environmental impact assessment, which is, probably a little bit closer to so like the, the conversation today around seaweed harvesting um, and they require um, a screening for biosecurity triggers uh, to be done first and if that screening turns out, turns out uh, risks and then there's a requirement to take a, a full environmental impact assessment. Now they're not prescribed exactly to what definition that should be but when you look at what they prescribe in there, and there's like the guidance notes there in that diagram on the right, and without going through it in any detail, you could argue that it's not dissimilar 
from the uh, European regulate, European Directive, uh, which of course is a licensing requirement in, in Ireland anyway, or certainly the screening, uh, followed by uh, an EIS, um, if the screen turns out to prove to be, to demonstrate that there's risks. Um, so again, some of this information may already be available to producers who want to consider these standards. So it is an, an option, is this an option? Um, well, in, implementation requires yeah, quite a comprehensive risk-based approach. Uh, so I would argue that you would need to uh, consider it uh, if, if this was an option for any businesses, uh, because there's some work involved in organizing and undertaking those risk assessments, because they're across a lot of different areas of the business, from environment to product, to management systems, um, to, the, to the wider distribution as well of, of product in the marketplace. Um, they are farm-based rather than wild. I mentioned I'm asking a question just to confirm that. So from a wild harvesting perspective, I think this is very much not applicable, but I wanted to just check that for everybody and I'll probably come back through more on, on that one. Um, there's a good balance of criteria if you're, if you're, if, if you're considering in that respect. If you remember that slide I put up, it does cover environment, it does cover product, it does cover food safety, it does cover social accountability. So it, it does a lot of contents included. So if, if there's a need to make uh, statements in the marketplace about how a business operates against those themes, it provides a good opportunity to do that uh, through that certification. It's a recognised and mature standard in the marketplace. So yeah, it's been the, the global gap set of standards have been around for a considerable number of years. So I have a recognition. So back onto that notion of brand recognition of having certification may offer value in that sense. However, at this point in time, the uptake in seaweed is very small, and, uh, and this is this is all I found so far. Uh, just three entities which are, are using this. So so the uptake has been quite quite uh, small. Um, on the seaweed side of things, um, whether that's because, again, there's other standards which have been used or whether the seaweed industries throughout Europe or even globally uh, are just not interested in standards and certification at this point in time is a good question and comments welcome on that as well. Now, we're moving on to so like the, 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 uh, the other standards and I'm going to say a little bit more about these two uh, entities, the Marine Stewardship Council and the Aquaputsu Stewardship Council. Can I can I interrupt you there for a second, Jay? We have Robin, and he seems to have his hand up for a while. Uh, Robin, do you oh. want to come there with a question? Or me? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can, yes. Oh, yes. Um, uh, my question is, um, for the wild harvest seaweed, the environmental standard varies quite a bit. Um, it varies from uh, a biomass standard, um, a check of biomass, perhaps before and after. There's language about not con causing a significant impact on the state of the aquatic environment. Um, a biodiversity screening, so that brings in biodiversity, um, assuming that means community biodiversity. Um, how are these practices actually put into effect in the field? It's a, it's a good question. I think if you, you're referring to the, I think that maybe the organic set and, and, and to some extent the, the, the global gap set. The, the organic regulation doesn't actually prescribe in too much detail what an entity should demonstrate against each of those, those, those criteria. So it, it, it's an interesting question in that regard because there is perhaps a concern that it does lead to a lot of variability in outcomes in certification. Um, and, and, and so what it does, it places a lot of uh, emphasis on the assessment body, the certifier, to be able to evaluate that, and evaluate the information that's been presented to, to make a, an opinion whether it's comprehensive enough. Um, yeah, so wh whether that's a biomass assessment based approach, whether it's some other um, con control rules which are being used, whether it's quota setting, um, whether it's a rotational thing with following periods, <laughs> there's no definition exactly of, of how that is prescribed. It just sort of like speaks of the sort of the higher principles about um, conservation of biodiversity, uh, sustainable harvesting in terms of, you know, about ensuring that 
sufficient stocks left for replenishment purposes, but there's no definition in that regard. So it, it's, to, to, some might argue it presents an opportunity because it might be an easier set of standards to uh, navigate and present information that might be considered um, suitable. And others may argue just the opposite. So, and, and, and I've seen that, so like all of that, so like being debated um, in, in that regard. So it's the organic set is very principled um, rather than being very so like prescriptive it, by definition across all of those different so like species, those different farming systems that are engaged in it. Um, I'm moving on to th this, this actually, this next so like part of the presentation probably digs a little bit deeper into, into that question actually in terms of, uh, you know, are the standards available which are so I like really try to become more prescriptive and definite about what 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 does good look like when it comes to sustainable harvesting and how should that be defined um, so i hope that's that's helpful or will be helpful as we as we move into this and i'm just looking in case there's another question i don't Moira, did victor have a question he did um, I was hoping you did. He had his hand up, but um, he seems to have um, disappeared. <laughs> That's fine. No problem. We can we can always take it later. Um, there is one more hand up just at this minute, Francis Gallagher. Um, Good. Hello. Yes. Hi, Dave. Um, I'm in Roaches Point. Um, I do a little bit of foraging locally for a cocktail bar and. Um, a restaurant with a 12 mile ethos. So my take would be a kilo a month or something like that, it's tiny. What I notice sometimes is the impact of the, I think utterly unregulated uh, periwinkle fishery, which seems to use migrant laborers, oh, a lot of gloves <laughs> and utterly clears the um, common periwinkle from the shore. And I just wondered whether there's any move to perhaps legislate a little bit on the take of um, other organisms on a, an Irish beach? That's my question. Thanks very much, Francis. Um, I, I do not know is my honest answer. Um, the, I'm, I'm assuming that the activity, well, I don't know how, how regulated that activity has been. I'm, I'm familiar yeah. with some other things that are happening in parts of Ireland. Um, uh, around cockle fisheries and picking, um, maybe not dissimilar in terms of the that the, the um, a migrant workforce will say may have been involved, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm 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 not too sure whether that activity would require foreshore licensing, for example. Um, and I'd be happy for anyone else to jump in there if so if they, if you're from the so like the regulator, um, and uh, who could maybe volunteer information. Um, but uh, no, thanks anyway, Francis, for the comment. Um, I, I can't really, so like, uh, I think, I don't, I don't know is my honest answer. Thanks, Dave. Okay, well, if someone, if someone pops up a, a response to that, I'm sure Maura can let me know. Um, so yeah, Marine Stewardship Council, MSC and Aquaculture, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, ASC. So these are two international not-for-profit programs. Um, MSC established um, uh, back in the early 1990s, actually, um, actually a, a, a formation out of uh, Unilever and WWF at the time uh, has transitioned and changed since then and into, into it in itself in, in terms of its size and scale. Um, with a so like a mission to reverse overfishing and promote sustainable fisheries and tackle IUU, uh, you know, the illegal, unregulated, unreported uh, components of fishing activity. And similarly, the ASC, which was actually formed to some extent um, out of the MSC, uh, but is very much an entity in itself, but uh, formed to focus on aquaculture and to address unsustainable aquaculture practices. Uh, you know, and both of these programs doing so by developing best practice standards or responsible practice standards or sustainable standards, if you want to call them in that sort like vein, um, to, to, to uh, you know, promote their use and thereby, of course, trying to uh, promote sustainability and sustainable fisheries and aquaculture practices. 
they both use these logos as an eco label as we commonly refer them to for products that have been certified as coming from either those fisheries which are certified or the aquaculture establishments which are certified to them. So in, bo in both occasions now I have so like international offices in different parts of the world so quite large ongoing um, you know entities in terms of programs and uh, very influential in that sense as well. So what do they tend to do? Well, certainly they do a lot of work, education, consumer behavior towards better environmental choices um, to their programs and activities and promotions, and also working not just with con the consumer, but working with supply chains. Uh, so very active in that sense. Um, as I mentioned, products access the eco label, some pictures of different products there with the eco label on it. Um, the MSC blue label, uh, Melasta, <laughs> I looked, I I think this is from 2018, carries its features on around 25,000 seafood products all over the world. Um, so in terms of its presence in the marketplace is noted. Um, you know, so so it, it, it is very visible in the marketplace and I'm sure you've come across it yourselves when you're shopping um, to one de degree or another. Probably the influence is more great, greatly exerted within the supply chain and the supply decisions when they make the choices of raw material seafoods of what products they choose from. Then on the aquaculture side, ASC, uh, there's about 1,400 certified farms at this point in time. I say about because there's more joining all the time and there's quite a lot always in assessment and occasionally some that drop out too, so an approximate. So these are very, so like very much the certainly MSC, the global leader in, in the world of fisheries. ASC, there are other entities, I mentioned GAA, Global Aquaculture Alliance BAT, BAT program, very active too, so probably somewhat, probably running around neck and neck in many respects in terms of how many active certificates that, uh, that they're operating, um, and Global Gap too as well. So MSC and ASC came together. Uh, I think in recognition, we're very much in recognition that seaweed sort of like was was very much, you know, included systems and practices which could range from wild harvesting all the way to, to very much closed, contained, um, onshore, um, single cell algae based uh, cultivation practices um, because it covers both uh, the macro and micro seaweed. Um, and then everything in between as well. So in terms of where aquaculture might be used to a certain level uh, or wild seaweed might be used and transferred or propagules from, from, from seaweed might be uh, produced in hatcheries and then of course put out into, into the, the, uh, uh, an open shore, an open environment. They include marine and freshwater as well in the algal set. Um, I uh, mentioned that they include land-based systems as well as uh, open systems at sea um, and they're founded on things like the FAO Code of Conduct um, and I'm going to maybe say a few words about that in the next slide actually and compliant to international standards such as ICL I mentioned this International Social Environmental Alliance uh, as well as the ISO 17065 uh, standards in terms of how they so like um, um, they use their procedures to demonstrate consistency, integrity. Oh, it's just a question that came through. Thank you. Um, I will do. Um, yeah. So yeah. So f f you know, and, and and I mentioned about about standards usually stepping above regulations, number one, uh, but it's also probably important to say that good standards have good foundations. They have good normative references of where, they, where they're where based upon, you know, and, and to anchor them, if you like, in their principles. And, and certainly the MSC and the ASC, ASC standards are set in the, so like the foundation of the United Nations uh, FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries and the guidelines for uh, environmental accreditation and labeling. Uh, as well as that ICO code of practice as well. So, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm suggesting this is a positive thing in that sense. And that's a snapshot from the MSC's website themselves. So they, I'm sure they would convey. Um, so it's a way of demonstrating internationally ac accepted best practice. Okay, so cover macro, microalgae, I mentioned that. Um, 
and pictures to represent that as well. And it's interesting that so far, and I should have said actually, this, this standard is relatively new. It came out in 2018. Um, and, the, and in the world of standards and certification, that mean it, means it is very new. Um, and so the uptake is only probably only starting to happen at this point in time. And I think there's only three or four certified entities um, or maybe only three actually under the uh, MSC ASC standard and they've tended to be more on these shore based biotechnology single cell production units which are either producing pigments or uh, producing omega-3 oils and those types of things rather than the so like the macro set of farm seaweeds um, and or wild harvested seaweeds uh, so it's quite early to know exactly the position, if you wish, and the interest and the uptake of this standard. So key areas that they address, okay, uh, environmental and social impact. So they, they do cover these things quite um, specifically and, and in a very prescriptive sense. Um, and you know, the top mantra, environmentally seaweed operations must show that they are actively they actively minimize their impact on the surrounding natural environment and socially seaweed operations must be managed in a responsible manner so producers must care for their employees work with the local community and be good and conscientious neighbors um, the standard applies globally to all locations of, of seaweeds uh, either from harvesting from farm sources or from wild populations so it's quite a balanced standard between the environmental side of it uh, of sustainability and the social side of sustainability. The, the ACMSC standard contains these five principles. One, maintaining sustainable wild populations, minimizing environmental impacts, uh, so very much specific to the environmental impacts associated with extracting seaweed, the harvesting vent, if you wish, um, both directly and, and indirect consequences of that. Um, there's a focus on ensuring effective management, number three. Um, and this is quite different than the other standards I've been talking about, where a lot of the other standards, whilst they draw on, let's say, the national or the international management system um, and its framework to, to some extent, though those other standards are very much focused on the business unit, on the entity involved, where the MSCASC standard is focused both at the applicant level, the users, if you wish, of the certificate and, the, and what, what's called the unit of assessment and the unit of certification, but also the management system around it. And the management system actually becomes part of that unit of certification. Um, so it's different in that regard. And people will often argue, including myself from time to time, that and I've spent a lot of time working on in the MSC world, not not really so much in seaweed. It's it's very new, um, but in other fisheries, that a lot of the work that a, an assessment body does is very much focused on the management system. You tend to spend mostly time speaking to the managers um, of a fishery, uh, scientists too, but managers in particular, um, as much as you do speaking to the actual applicant. So it's kind of the management system that has to do a lot of work here in delivering the evidence to demonstrate that they meet the requirements of these principles one and two um, and indeed to some extent four and five but as we step to four then promoting social responsibility it becomes more business unit focused or unit of, of certification focused and then number five strengthening community relations and the interaction that the entity the unit of certification has in the community that's where that's measured again and it becomes more about the business unit but the could be drawing on so like national references and, and, and uh, frameworks in that regard. Okay, the assessment process. So what are the steps in the process? And again, I've taken this off the website, courtesy of them. I wanted to just to sort of show you, this, this is sort of like a, a fairly lengthy uh, uh, assessment process. There's an, a, lot, a lot of different steps in it. Uh, having said that, they're well prescribed and identified. So, you know, there's lots of fisheries who've been through this process. So uh, um, I'm not saying it in a way to, to complicate it. It's just that if you take this journey, it is an it's a, it is an endeavor and something that you would probably need to prepare for. And what the ASC MSC have done is created a pre-assessment process. And certainly they advise that that should be used. I would certainly do the same as well. And so like, it's like a mini assessment 
which takes the principles and criteria of the MSC standard, but uh, allows it to be done in a much shorter space of time, a preview, if you like, a purview, um, and it gives you a sort of like an understanding of what the outcome would be before you start to make a decision on a full assessment where you would point and appoint a, a CAB, a certification body. Um, the other points I'm making here is that I would advise anybody who looks at moving into the assessment uh, using the MSC ASC standard that you have very good project management and you would assign resources to do so to respond to the needs, whether you do it internally, whether you include consultants, all those things are, be, uh, are done. And just to give you a, so like an understanding of how so like comprehensive and, and um, important, I guess, that certainly the MSC standard has become in certain parts of the world. If you look in the in, towards Canada, which is probably our, our, one of the greatest users of MSC uh, certification in its fisheries, and you look at the management entity DFO, Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, they, they've actually assigned roles to their um, their people, if you like, their employees, specifically to address and manage the MSC certificates on behalf of fisheries. So I'm saying that just as a point of reference to say that it is a quite quite a, a significant endeavour to step into an, an MSC ASC assessment. There's also a requirement for a lot of stakeholder, stakeholder input. Um, it's a public process as well, um, but the stakeholder input is that broad-based stakeholders from the management system, uh, the community scientists involved as well in, in that particular seaweed or scientists from other areas who have knowledge about the species, for example, who can support an assessment and also the supply chain too. Yeah, it's a public process, so public sta stakeholder comments form part of the process throughout it. And again, this is so like breaking it down a little bit further. Um, so one of the, the pre-assessment basically gives you an opportunity to identify the scope uh, of, the, of the assessment um, and what the client entity would look like. And uh, I mentioned these two words, unit of assessment and unit of certification. Uh, which are, are very important things to define. And uh, have a, I think I have a slide on that next, but um, we, without having a very definite understanding of what the units are, the unit of assessment and then the unit of certification, which is basically the entity that receives the certificate, um, it will lead to problems. So if you do enter this process, it, it needs to have careful consideration. And it really comes down to the ge geography of the harvesting operations, uh, the systems used to harvest them, farming or wild harvesting, of course, uh, involved in that, the production units involved in that, um, the species, in, of course, in terms of its range um, and its locations and the management system around it, as well as all the users of that particular resource. So when you're doing an ASC MSC assessment, the assessment just doesn't focus on the actual entity that's interested in receiving the certificate, arguably the entity that's putting up the money and taking the risk. The assessment looks at everything else too. So anything else which has an impact on that resource from a harvesting point of view um, is also considered in the assessment, regardless of whether indeed they will receive certification. Uh, and so, so it is quite an all-encompassing type approach to that word sustainability. But the pre-assessment does allow you to identify blind spots, challenges, and you know the idea then giving you some time to address and fix that. And some of you may have heard of the term fisher improvement projects or aquaculture improvement projects. Um, and a lot of those fisheries and aquaculture entities which want to use the ASC and the MSC standard first do a pre-assessment and then and use that to create an improvement pro process or an improvement plan. And there are there are so like dedicated uh, entities now, uh, fisheryprogress.org, for example, where you can have that information presented and measured in a formal project um, in, in that sense. So it creates formality around it as well. And the, the idea is that you're journeying your improvement towards meeting MSC or ASC performance indicators and being able to pass the, so like the MSC audit. So yeah, it's quite a comprehensive thing. The full assessment contains a number of different stages. Uh, it requires a public announcement, which happens on the MSC ASC website, um, so that stakeholders have an, uh, who may have an interest in engaging in the process have an opportunity to reach out um, 
they reach out to the sexual certification body and they can take the opportunity either to supply information or indeed they could request uh, uh, the assessment team to visit them. So when they're in that location, the, the assessment team is obliged to go and converse with these stakeholders uh, so that they can present their own information, you know, positive or negative, whatever that might be. And there's a number of different reporting phases as well between a, a client draft, a public comment draft report, and then a final report, uh, which gets posted back onto the ACMSC website and is subject to final comments uh, from stakeholders who may wish to object against the decision that's been taken of whether to certify or not to certify. And those objections uh, have to be addressed by the certification body um, before any final certification report can be um, can be given, oh, sorry, or even certificate and the report, the final report published, and then thereby leading to access to the ASC or the MSC logo. Once you've done all that, and the uh, the MSC ASC standard gives a, a twelve month timeline. So what they're saying is, from the point of application to the point of certification, it can take no longer than twelve months. Um, there's some provisions around that which allows some extension. Um, but I'm not going to go into the detail, it's quite detailed of what's allowed and what's not allowed, but it sets a time frame. Um, and 12 months is not so like, um, it, it is not unrealistic in terms of it, it, it is a very lengthy process. There's lots of stops and starts in it. Uh, and they're designed to allow public and public and stakeholders an opportunity to review information and comment on them and then the certification body to respond to those comments. So typically for, for four week periods, information's made public or two weeks at the beginning and the announcement as well. After you receive certification, uh, there's a surveillance process. So the certificate is a three year certificate. And then on the prior to the anniversary of the first year, there's a requirement to undertake a surveillance audit, which is like a mini assessment. Um, and any corrective actions which were presented in the original audit um, can be reviewed by the certification body. And obviously the entity has to demonstrate that they're closing out these um, conditions as they call them. Then after the second audit comes the reassessment uh, prior to the expiry of the certificate on three years. So you have to start well in advance if you want continued certification uh, or uninterrupted certification as they call it. I think I've probably said enough about this. And probably a little bit about this in terms of the pre-audit, identifying the uh, strengths and weaknesses and the units. So is anything out of scope? Um, harvesting of farming activities involving the introduction of alien species are not eligible for certification. So um, alien species and non-natives are out of scope, however, if the introduction occurred at least 20 years prior to that date of the application, and then, then, then they are allowed to move forward. Um, or if the alien species is cultured on land facilities that are completely separated from the aquatic environment. And I mentioned that it's the standard is applicable to microalgae. So of course, if you had species which are non native to the environment, but of course you may be producing that in, in closed containment systems, um, in, in, in you know, typically fermentation systems, if you wish, uh, and it could be 2,000 miles away from the sea. So like, unlikely to have any impact, of course, in terms of the aquatic and the marine environment, and therefore are allowed. So I put this picture up and, and I'll let someone correct me, but uh, I understand it to be uh, a recent uh, identified uh, alien species or non-native species in Irish waters. Uh, identified, I don't know if it's GMIT or Goa University, Golden Kelp. Uh, I found a reference to it to 2018. So I'm happy again if anybody wants to say, no, that's not correct. Or oh, um, I'm just looking at questions here. Um, it's just, it's a, I maybe just say this more, a little, little comment back to, to, to you, Francis. Um, if you've got any worries about sustainable exploitation, contact SFPA and uh, they'll provide you some information there. So seaweed production systems. Um, I mentioned that the standard covers a whole so like range from wild harvesting, uh, farmed at sea using wild seed, 
uh, farmed at sea from propagated seed, uh, so no land-based facility, the, but still a farming operation, of course, still farming intervention, farmed at sea, uh, but also using a land-based land seed, so seed which is propagated on land and, and then obviously uh, put out to sea or farmed on land using wild seed or farmed on land with internal seed. So lots of different connotations. And the, the, the reason why I mentioned strongly that the pre-assessment is, is uh, important is because it helps you define and understand which category you're working within, because that will also dictate what elements or principles and criteria are applicable to your particular assessment. Because some of these will not be in, in as you move away from wild harvesting, for example. So yeah, the unit of assessment. Uh, unit, units of assessment for this standard include the species name, its geographic region, uh, the management system I mentioned, production and harvest methods, um, the client group, uh, applicant for assessment, and it sometimes can be quite challenging to sort of identify and, and agree what that client entity will be. Uh, it's worth sort of like considering that in quite some detail uh, about what it would look like. Uh, and, and then that would form the unit of certification and the unit of assess assessment will be all the other considerations which aren't in those client uh, within the client group, but yet at the same time may have an impact or do because they, they're, act they're actively uh, taking from the resource, if you wish, or using the resource. So will have an impact that would be measured. And that's from the ASC MSC website saying so in pictures. So moving on to the so like the standard and the scoring process a little bit, and I'm just giving a a flavour here of one or two of them, um, and then just to give a bit more insight into how it works. Um, but you know, and I would say to anybody who's interested in in engaging in this particular standard, speak to the MSC and ASC. Um, it would be advisable even to go and go on to one of their training sessions uh, and their training session sessions are far more comprehensive than what I'm what, what I've got time to do today uh, typically would be a day's work or a two-day training session and really having a deep dive into the the actual standard and the, the scoring process uh, and, and how to go about it so I mentioned those five top principles in an earlier slide. Underneath each one of those, and this is taken again from, from MSCAC's website directly, just listed them, how they, how they so like documented themselves. Underneath each one of those and is a set of performance indicators. Um, so the, the MSCAC standard very much is a performance-based standard based on objective evidence being presented by the applicant or the management system and its supporting stakeholders, scientists, if you wish, through that audit. Um, and a lot of this information, of course, is it, it takes more than just the site visit occasion. And a site visit could last up to a week on some of these larger entities in terms of the different um, stakeholders that we need to be visited and interviewed. Um, but it takes a lot of planning, a lot of information preparation before the audit has to be undertaken and, and uh, evaluated by, by the applicant. So these performance indicators, so a range of different ones are on, on numbers under each one, but culminating to 31 performance indicators, uh, as I said, not always applicable to all, all particular circumstances. And as you, I was Obviously, I think it's probably fair to say, as you move away from what would be considered a, a wild harvesting operation, and certainly as you get to the other end of the spectrum where you're looking at single cell microalgae cultivation, then P1, of course, has a, a reduced relevance going down to, down to zero. But wherever you are in terms of farming operation, somehow engaging in so like a wild resource of seaweed, whether it's by taking adults and for propagation or taking juveniles for propagation and moving them, then there will be elements of principle one involved um, or full requirements of principle one involved in terms of the impact of that particular activity on the sustainability of the population in general. And then under principle two, it talks about the wider impacts and it really spells these out in terms of impacts on the habitats, ecosystem structure and function, uh, endangered and threatened and protected species and so on and so forth. I've got another slide and I think I mentioned the importance of the management system as well, being engaged with the applicant who wants to um, look at 
moving towards ASC, our MSC assessment, it's vital that the management system is engaged too and is participatory in that sense. Um, otherwise, it becomes challenging. Um, I know it because I've worked in assessments where that has been the case. Uh, and it's difficult for the client when a management system isn't engaged and involved and, and so like supportive in that sense. And then principle four, social responsibility and five, community relations interactions. So I'll say a few words about those as we move through. So the assessment's based on scoring. So pretend you're taking an almighty exam. Um, you've got to hit a target level if you want a full pa pass, which might be described as best practice. However, there are these things called minimum scores. And if you don't achieve a full pass, you might achieve a minimum score, but it leads to a condition being set. So the, and the condition really is basically saying there's a room for improvement um, and sets a requirement that you have to improve in order to even to move past that point in time, you will have to present a, an action plan of how you're going to address the specific performance indicator to achieve a full pass level. So you have to demonstrate how, you, how you're going to do it. And of course, that might take resources uh, and it may take science, it, you know, and we know that science is expensive. So uh, conditional passes are, are no, and so like no easy things, and, you know, um, to, 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 to so like um, comprehend. If you, if you don't achieve a conditional pass, uh, you fail. You go below the minimum and you don't pass the assessment. So any critical condition means you don't pass the assessment until such time that you can move that particular score up, either through presenting a, of further evidence or indeed by undertaking research, other activities around the management system, perhaps around how that stock has been exploited before you can then present that information uh, to move it to a conditional or full pass. And on those conditional passes as well, there's a threshold. So you can only survive a certain number of conditional scores before you're out and you fail the assessment. And it depends and depends on, on what type of farming or, or harvesting system you're using, as I mentioned earlier, but it, it, it changes between six and eight of those particular <clears throat> performance indicators. So a conditional pass requires a client action plan, as I mentioned. Um, and a critical condition requires a corrective action, and that has to be done in three months' time. So you'd only have a, a, a small window of opportunity to affect a critical condition and change it uh, if you want to stay within the assessment process. Uh, under into certain exceptions, it can be extended to six months. If you fail to, to achieve it. Sorry, Dave, yes. we've got two good questions in there. One from mm -hmm. Shane McShoreland and one from um, Jim Kyo, if you can take it. Are they um, are the questions written? Um, yes, yeah, sorry, Dave. They're in there in the Q and A. But if Shay or Jim um, wishes to speak, um, if you just put your hand up. So Shay is asking about Principle Five. What form does it take? And Jim is asking in relation to Principle Three. One, two, and three is compatible. Do you think the principle tree, one, two, and three, is compatible with the unregulated environmental for wild harvesting in Ireland? Um, okay, um, one, two, and three. Um, I, I think that there's challenges there. Um, I, I think you may have good evidence at a, at a, at a, at a local level based on what the practitioners are, are engaged in, in in their own assessment work and in, in terms of evaluating uh, stock status, we'll say, and and how to uh, sustainably harvest and understanding of what is a safe harvesting level on stock status. Um, without having and you know and 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 then by virtue of that probably an understanding in terms of the ecosystem and habitat impact of that in, in terms of very because a lot of focus in terms of Stock, looking at stock status, stock status when I can speak, also refers to, you know, if you're cutting seaweed and cutting seaweed back, of course, it's going to have so like an environmental consequence as well on the habitat and on the ecosystem and, and its structure and function. So that potentially has already been considered, I think, at a local level for some businesses who are engaged in harvesting wild seaweed. But it's probably true to say that it, 
it would be helpful if there's a framework around that, a national framework or a customary framework that sets so like certain uh, requirements on harvesting systems, or it would be, what I'm saying is, yeah, it, it would be a positive thing from a certification point of view. Others may have differences of opinion in terms of you know, management and, and et cetera, but specifically speaking in terms of meeting the requirements of, of this standard, it probably be, would be of value, yes. And the other question was, sorry, Mori, I can't see it coming up on my screen, it seems to. Okay, so it's Shay. Shay actually has his hand up, so Shay might um, just ask you directly. If that's okay. Hi, Dave. Can you hear me? I can, Shay. Basically, there's a word in Gaelic, spite famine. It means rows over seaweed. It uses a standard for a localized rows. But we have a situation where there's conflict between property rights, which are registered, property rights, which are acquired, and continual usage rights. And they haven't become very vocal conflicts, but there are questions that my group, FIS Famine, and the other group that I'm involved with, Coast Watch Ireland, are getting questions on, on an intermittent basis, particularly when at any point anything hits the media. And um, there has been no structure. The minister has come out with press releases on it, but uh, we're a bit thin in regulation and reg re legislation in this matter, particularly for possible, more than possible, probable conflict resolution. Thanks very much, Shay. Um, yes, it would. It, what you've just said will, will most likely have a bearing on the outcome of the assessment. Um, without having the details, it's difficult to say to what extent. Um, and it's not this, the, the 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 standards not saying you can't have conflict. What it's saying is that you should have conflict resolution processes in place to exactly. manage that conflict. And deal with it. So it's that what, where the assessment will probably look to, uh, rather than you know the, the the actual fact that there's conflict happening, because conflict, of course, is a part and parcel of all all types of fisheries in in reality. Um, but but without a frame, as I mentioned, so like a framework, either a national or even a customary level, some kind of framework that can be can be pointed to to say this is how we manage so like that. Um, and there, 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 are, there are requirements as well that that framework itself, itself should function correctly. So if it doesn't resolve conflict, then there's another problem there too. Um, so um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's a, it's, yeah, certainly a, a, a point you're raising which will be of significance, um, in, you know, in moving forward from the audit. And you know, and it's back on, I guess, to what I was suggesting around anyone who wanted to look at this particular approach this particular MSCAC audit process would do the pre-audit first understand what where the the, the the black spots are if you like where the challenges are um, and put a plan together and typically we call them these fishery improvement plans or aquaculture improvement plans however you want to describe that but uh, um, you know and, and it may be that the, there is a, a significant period of time required between a pre-audit and a full audit to allow that journey to happen and those so like that that information and all, all that framework even to be created if it does require that um so it's yeah it, it, it it's a it's very much this is very much a, a journey approach to standards and certification rather than something that i think any entity should just jump on uh, immediately you know and, and and really think it through thank you for that <laughs> Um, I think we've got to that, yeah. So information gathering, look at the time as well. Um, I, well I'll, I'll, I'll try and so I get to one of the so like the, the scoring parts of this. So information gathering, I think I've gone through enough of this. Um, um, it's a significant sort of like piece of work. There's a significant site visit, uh, uh, you know, which will you know want to engage with the various stakeholders um, at all levels. So the stock state is 1.1 performance indicator. What's it all about? Well, it's really about trying to sort of like understand and evaluate management behavior towards harvesting. But of course that comes down to some very specific things uh, about management, about harvesters having a knowledge of the standing stock and where those, so like the way that, where those uh, resources are based. Um, you know, so that requires science, it requires monitoring. 
uh, and then how it considers the longer term changes in productivity over time and productivity can change for a number of reasons environmental changes or anthropogenic changes as well um, the knowledge of the actual species of course is going to be fundamental in, in, in all of this and understanding the biology uh, the life cycle of the species that you're managing or you're harvesting is critical to being able to define a harvesting strategy as it's called that is effective and then of course how you're measuring that strategy once you've developed a strategy you know and strategies can range from many different things and a lot of people here will probably understand this i'm not sure if everybody's comes from a world of fisheries but uh, i just put it up as a quick snapshot in terms of a lot a lot of these approaches work on this so like this model called maximum sustainable yield or uh, elements of this and this is very theoretical to, for seaweed but I, I'm, I'm using it anyway just to, as a description so if you look at this gra graph graph on along the bottom axis you've got air for fishing effort you know and that could come to many different things fishing vessels nets in the water um pots traps and in depending on all types of fisheries of course we, me we measure f uh, in different ways harvesting seaweed uh how that could be prescribed is an interesting proposition i think in terms of uh, certainly wild seaweed how it's been cut um and it, you know could you base it on uh, a number of so like practitioners who are harvesting is it based on time on the shore side if it's the shore side so like a shoreline harvest the harvesting uh, system that's being used uh, but that needs to be thought out of course how how to measure f in a seaweed situation and of course f then so that has a relationship with catch or how much of seaweed you're collecting and that curve of course changes depending on all different types of species um, and the strength of that curve as well is very dependent on different types of species and how species respond to uh, effort, catch effort. But somehow what most fisheries try and get to is something called MSY, a maximum sustainable yield. Uh, so what is a maximum amount of uh, fishing effort which returns the maximum catch? Uh, sorry, the, sorry, what is the, the effort that returns the maximum catch without causing overfishing? and as you can see as you get <clears throat> excuse me as you get closer to f uh, msy you're in danger of going over over the curve and entering in the world of overfishing and of course as you come down that slope you move to overfishing status to an overfished status or a depleted so you perhaps could be talking about a depleting resource and a fully depleted resource in in in, in a seaweed type language and so it's of course is important for anybody who's entering this assessment from a wild harvesting point of view, that they have an understanding of how that plays out for their operation. Um, and of course, there is something in the world of fishing uh, and, and fishery science called uh, a precautionary approach as well, because as you get closer to MS, MSY, it's kind of understood that you're getting closer to a more risk um, environment or a risk place where you are in danger of tipping over the edge because you never ever certain of course and there's a lots of variables in fisheries and in seaweed included so the idea in a precautionary world is you step back a little bit just like you'd step back from the edge of a cliff if you uh, if you were wearing a blindfold um, because it would be more precautionary so the idea of course is to have a, a level of precaution built in in the way that you're uh, defining your harvesting strategy and your management system and these are the words which the MSCASC standard use and these are the words that you'll find in the FEO code of conduct and, and their, uh, their technical guidelines. So this is again just taken from directly from the MSC standard and they call it an assessment tree uh, how it's configured and this is so like putting a window on principle one stock status um, and so you would take each of those performance indicators as an assessor um, or indeed if you were looking to, to meet the requirements you would do it from the other side and say how we're going to do this um, and you could so that so it's taking 1.1 stock status the scoring issue um, and so what are we what are we considering here is the stock status relative to irreversible impact so in other words how do we demonstrate the stock status is always and continually maintained at a place that avoids irreversible impact and there's a minimum and a target as i mentioned a minimum where you'd get a condition or a target best practice with the ideal place you want to be and and these are the words directly from the standard you know that available information on the minimum side you know, indicates that the wild stock is above the point where the harvest impact is irreversible or very slowly irreversible 
Okay, so at what point does that occur? And the target level you're looking for is the wild stock is at a, or, is at, or fluctuating around that MSY level <clears throat> or a proxy of that, and we'll mention proxies in a second, or available information indicates that harvesting impacts causes insignificant change to the wild stock, which is unlikely to be detectable against natural variability for this population, or if detectable is minimal and has no impact on population dynamics. So what I'm without so like having time to go into so like the very detail of this, what I'm trying to convey here is, and, and, and this came to a question earlier on, some of the other standards have words around principles, um, which describe sustainability. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but as you go into this particular standard, it becomes more prescriptive in terms of an exactness of what that particularly means from a from a seaweed perspective. And so, yeah, someone's asking a question. Ewan's mentioning ex accepting the different standards have a different emphasis and the ACMSC is relatively new. Would you say it's likely that the ACMSC seaweed standard is likely to become the gold standard? I would probably say it is already, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. It, 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 it is the gold standard in terms of being so prescriptive uh, in its criteria. You know, so we, if, if you meet the standards of the MSC standard, you could consider that your, your management system is best in class. Whether that gives you best in class marketing opportunities, et cetera, is a business decision. And that's for, I think, for, for, for every indiv individual business to so like comprehend and understand. But certainly I think in terms of uh, available standards today, I would suggest that it would be considered best in class. Yeah, uh, it's the gold standard. So yeah, how would you go about estimating what, what might be considered as safe harvesting levels? And typically, of course, in, in seaweed, you will be looking at using proxies or surrogates. Um, so measurable alternatives to, set, to determine safe harvesting levels, principally because we're not really doing full-blown um, survey surveys uh, uh, that you might find in so, sort of some of the other let's say large pelagic fisheries where you're deriving that through a model a stock assessment model actual so like numbers in terms of volume and and, and, and in terms of tons of product which is available for harvesting and trying to set safe harvesting limits on that so these are more looking at well what else can we use which would be an indicator to say this is safe uh, or this is risky and usually uh, we would look at things like biological characteristics of the species because they're often understood. So you go for where we have the best knowledge available, you know, so things like how does it recover? How does it regrow once it's been cut or once it's been harvested? And okay, some species here, Scophilum and Cresselia, um, you know, can you create an estimation of the biomass needed to allow the population to regrow um, based on your understanding of the biology of the species? Um, thereby saying sort of proxy to MSI might be a, a biomass per unit area, uh, you know, so because you can maybe sample and get an understanding of biomass within per, within units and use that as a basis to scale it. Um, so how much should be left after harvesting as a safe practice? Uh, if you're working with species which don't regenerate after cutting um, or harvesting, um, then the recovery might depend on, on, on other things. So in other words, leaving sufficient individuals individuals fully intact so it's it's sort of still a cropping exercise but you're taking you're taking the full um um plant but and leaving full plants behind but of course understanding what that density looks like is going to be important in terms of what that proxy to msy is going to be um and you know and i guess it's true to say a lot of of the world of fisheries is is being done by looking in a in the rear view mirror i think in some extent in other words you only know where you are when you have an understanding where you've been and i guess it's true to say in, in seaweed harvesting as well and i think probably i'm really happy if, if people want to ask questions about this because i think it's probably one of the more interesting and significant areas for harvesting um as well as everything else as well and uh, i'm sure some of you have got some experience about doing biomass uh, surveys and, and estimates in seaweed and what a safe harvesting strategy might look like. 
so yeah and yeah harvesting strategies and measures you know and and these are some of so like i've so like taken some of these from MS, msc website and and some thoughts as well um of what could be used uh to describe a harvesting strategy or as a basis for harvesting strategies such as percentage of standing stock of assessed biomass allowed to be harvested per year um you know and, and accounting for things like the species as, as i mentioned whether it's fast growing slow growing rate of growth of course is going to be important um considering all the variables and the environment um you know which may have a longer term impact on the ecosystem whether that's other issues affecting habitat degradation for example um other users on that resource as well as i mentioned before uh, and other mechanisms for harvest strategies such as introducing quotas um you know which are based on you know estimates of standing stock in certain areas um introducing following periods introducing licensing um all these so like mechanisms um and, and vehicles and strategies can be used to, to create the measures required to have a harvesting strategy that ensures that the stock status is, is maintained at that MSY level or its proxy. Okay. So Dave, we have a few questions in there for, yeah. from Pete McGovern. Can you see the questions? Um, this is, I can see, this is safe for species. What about a standard for safe for ecosystems? Um, Pete has proxies, refers to a population ability to recolonize, and um, MSY refers to an individual's ability to regrow. regrow. So these are questions he's asking. I don't know if, yeah. if, if Pete is there, um, you're more than welcome to. Um, Maybe jump. you could turn your mic on, Pete. I just, I, for some reason, some of the questions are just not coming up on mine. Well, it's just to get a definition of proxy and MSY in terms of uh, sustainability. Oh, Pete, how are you? Okay, I oh, see okay. your questions now. So, so, so okay. Yeah. So go on, I'll let you speak. Yeah, like if, if you, some of the, of the algae, as you say there, you can cut them down to a certain level and they'll regrow. And that, I'd refer to that as, as an MSY. It's easy to define it. But others, you have to allow the whole population to come back because some are not able to regrow after harvesting. So would that be a fair differential between proxy and MSY true? Um, oh, well, I, I think maybe this, the, this sort of like points of view are the same thing. Sorry. Um, I, I think, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so, you know, cropping and allowing, allowing it to recover and, and regrow um, is an understanding of what level you can cut it at. Uh, I, probably and what period of time you need to have before it regrows so that's sort of forming a strategy around that whereas removing the uh, the entire so like um well i wouldn't really really put it in removing the population but you're removing so like you know uh, an area you maybe take, taking an area and sort of saying well we we can safely remove Th this the, the seaweed from this area because the population is, su is such that it will repopulate this area because there's plenty of other um, uh, plants around it if you like seaweeds around it that will, will populate the area um, that that would be so sort of like one way of putting it you know and then the, the third one of that I think I mentioned is that you take out a number of um, uh, of of plants if you wish from that area and leave some behind and all, all of this of course has a bearing on the the next point i'm going to speak about which is principle two which is about the impacts on the uh, habitat and the ecosystem you know and some will have more lesser or more uh, greater impact and that's obviously going to be reflected in it as well all right thanks dave thanks sam um Environmental impacts, yeah, okay. So this looks at just these things, structure and function of the habitats. So wh what, whatever you're doing in, in harvesting, uh, there's a whole set of criteria under principle two that um, you have to also consider and meet the requirements of, um, which refers to the fact that 
the structure and function of the habitat should be preserved. So, you, you, you know, the level of impact, you know, let's always say that there will be an impact, but the level of impact has such that it doesn't lead to irrecoverable damage to the, to the structure of, of the habitat, its functions, and all, all the solar elements in, involved in that, nor the solar ecosystem structure and function in general as well. Um, it moves on then into environmental, uh, sorry, into the, the um, endangered, threatened and protected species as well. So you can have negative consequences on, on protected designations, uh, which will be an interesting thing as well for, for, for from an Irish context, given the, the le level of Natural 2000 designations, for example. So there are a lot of protected designations over habitats and certain species within those habitats already. And there's a lot of work done on appropriate assessments, which could be of value, absolutely, uh, in these regards. But whether or not seaweed practices and, and, and activities have been evaluated against those appropriate assessments, of course, will be the question in terms of how valuable that information would be. Then some, some other clauses under this particular principle look at waste management and pollution. So more the, so like the, the other a, a activities uh, which may create wastes around particularly farming um, and, and how that's controlled and pests, uh, even energy is included. So it, again, it's a P2 really looks at a, a much broader impact from on the, um, on the environmental factors such as carbon, such as energy, in other words, uh, looks at translocations as well. So moving species from one certain region to another region, even though they might be indigenous in the country and introduction of alien species, as I've mentioned as well earlier on is part of the evaluation. Um, I'm going to just sort of mention this now uh, and I probably have to move on a little bit. All of this I mentioned, of course, is, is very, very information hungry um, and requires a lot of a lot of information and a lot of monitoring on an ongoing basis to demonstrate it. And we did. So like I think I touch upon the fact that these standards are they're challenging and they can present present barriers to entry and they do. Um, but uh, the standards bodies are, are looking at alternative routes in terms of trying to achieve an, a, what you know access to these particular standards, allow applicants to to access them, uh, and still maintain that best in class gold standard as well. And risk based frameworks have been so like developed by MSC in particular and ASC two um, for areas where we we have information deficiencies. Um, and typically, risk based frameworks. Uh, uh, really use a, a blend of qualitative and quantitative information and a lot of stakeholder input. And those stakeholders can come from a variety of different places from obviously the practitioners themselves, local knowledge is important, you know, and where it's objective and it can be verified, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic relevance. Um, but also uh, entities such as science management uh, uh, representatives etc all should be taking part in these risk-based frameworks and i would surmise that entities in, in the wild seaweed harvesting um, group which wanted to look at this standard are probably going to look at the risk-based framework it's probably going to be the place where i think um, a lot of those p1 performance indicators um, all VP1 performance indicators are going to be evaluated um, and quite a number of the P2 ones and I'll put a little list at the bottom what can be evaluated under a risk-based approach uh, because the evidence requirements to follow the, so like the, the formal process without the risk assessment um, can be quite challenging um, whereas having a so like an approach where you can use more quality a more qualitative approach through a risk framework um, might have some values and getting you to through the process and delivering an outcome that is still of value in terms of being able to understand the consequences of any particular actions on the stock and the harvesting strategy on say here we're looking at p2 species on what what, what it might be doing to those habitats etps and an ecosystem structure and function to be able to say yes this is a safe strategy or no it's not and for the start, there's something called consequence analysis, which is available. I know the development something called Seeker as well, um, just scale intensity consequence analysis. Um, but what I'm showing is just a small element involved where what, what these risk assessments tend to do is try and get the group to identify what are the, what's the most vulnerable component 
of the stock or the issue you're looking at. So it could be a, a protected species or it could be a component of the habitat uh, and identify that subcomponent which is most vulnerable, uh, whereby it would lead to a damage or irreversible damage or a measure of damage for that particular um, element, whether it be habitat or whether it be a species. Uh, and these are just some things which are uh, prescribed uh, population size, of course, re reproductive capacity of what we're looking at, the age, size and sex structure, uh, geographic range, all of these to one extent or another leads to a, a level of vulnerability. And the whole idea is to have stakeholders sitting around and making decisions based on the available information of which one is the most vulnerable one, and then using that as a basis to construct, if you like, a uh, an understanding of what the impacts a, a, a particular harvest and strategy is having. And it gets more detailed as you look through the different risk-based approaches. So uh, this is a productivity sus susceptibility analysis, which can be used in principle two uh, for certain uh, for certain those criteria. So again, it's just a little bit more evolved here. It's looking at productivity attributes, say, of any individual species, where there's a concern that there's an impact from harvesting seaweed in this case. And you may again start to list those attributes um, you know, and this is this is quite prescriptive in many recent extents, so it's good, but at the same time is relying on qualitative as well as quantitative information available to a group who are looking at doing this. Um, so yeah, some of the pra parameters, average age of maturity, average uh, maximum age, fecundity, all these things of course are going to affect that ability to, for that species to respond to a pressure. Um, and so on and so forth and then on the other side susceptibility in other words what is it what we do which makes it more susceptible to to, to that pressure uh, is it because of all overlap between the activity that activity of harvesting um, and that particular species is it more to do with encounterability uh, about this particular way that we harvest or is there other other components of that in terms of selectivity and gears, of course, because this is referring to, to fishing in general as well, but it can refer to cross seaweed harvesting gears as well and potential impacts on, on uh, P2. Okay, and then P3 talks about the customary framework as well. Um, and this was came up as a comment. Um, and I did mention already, yeah, it's quite different from the other standards is that there's a strong focus on the management system and the management system really needs to be involved because uh, the, the assessment team will ask for that and they'll ask to so like have meetings with the management managers on the resource and the management framework and you know in simple sense it's covering that there are some kind of laws in place or other so like customary framework that is respected and it can be demonstrated to have been respected in that sense in terms of it's implemented. Um, the the de decision-making process as well is transparent. Uh, what it means by that, it can be made available to public. So the public in general understand the how the management system works and the decision-making basis um, uh, because of that, as well as obviously the participants, um, that it follows a precautionary approach, as I've said, and that there's also monitoring control in place so some type of level of monitoring to understand what good looks like in the world of compliance. Um, and that there's also some kind of levels of sanctions um, which, which are applicable um, to and conducive to, so like a, a, an outcome of good practice, of course, as well. Okay, quickly then, social responsibility um, without going into to too much detail. Uh, so this focuses on on the actual entity itself, and you know it, it's stepping into the world of social responsibility. It pulls on something called the SA eight thousand standard, actually, a social a social accountability standard. You know, so operators must ensure that workers are protected from harm, and a lot of this then comes again from ILO, International Labour Organization, um, and they do make a point that the workers should have some environmental training, so an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing why they're following certain so like strategies and rules. That's so like there's performance indicators under the social responsibility criteria. Uh, during an audit, uh, the audit team, and they'll have specialist auditors who are trained in this world of social accountability, um, they will sample 15% uh, of the workforce 
that client entity to a maximum of 40 people. So there's rules as well. And it means that they will interview these people in the workforce. And these interviews are meant to be undertaken separate from the managers so that workers are freely able to converse and speak truthfully and openly about their work situation um, at that point in time, vis-a-vis -vis these criteria. Uh, in that sense, you know, and if, a, if we went back to the beginning of the, sort of like the, the uh, presentation and I was showing some pictures of, of Southeast Asia um, and I mentioned in terms of the, the amount of workers involved in some of these operations, it probably gives you an understanding of why social accountability and social responsibility is becoming an important part of the global standards for aquaculture and fisheries um, because it's seen as a sort of like a, an important attribute to sustainability so without so like sustainable workforces um you know who and who are, who are sustained in in legal and appropriate ways um arguably it's not a sustainable operation and then the community relations and, and interactions steps even wider than that looking at the communities around um seaweed harvesting uh and it's and it, and quite a, becoming quite an important feature of course and would be from certainly the harvesting of wild seaweed uh from from shorelines for example uh it really again talks about ensuring that the entity doesn't restrict access that it accommodates needs of other users it doesn't impact or affect the rights of other users i think that comment was made <clears throat> um and it requires if that information isn't available that there's a, an, an assessment undertaken specific to uh social needs and community relations and there's a prescription of how that should be done within the standard oh, I'm dave i'm thinking i'm thinking we need to close yeah. up <laughs> i know i know listen i'm i'm gonna I, i'm gonna sort of say we'll wind right back right to the to this and all, all i'm going to say is that if i leave this up um so this is really about is it does it offer an opportunity and if people want to just comment on this to close out i'm, I'm happy to do that and well I'll, I'll wait for comments to come through uh, you know and, and i guess well maybe not that standard this is really just talking about recognition of MSCAC and the, the work they do to demonstrate that it is recognized and those percentages speak for themselves. Uh, choices, <laughs> I guess. Is there a choice here between organic, between eco, between best practice and good practice standards, you know, and I guess it, uh, you know, we had this conversation at the beginning. Uh, it's probably factual to say consumers respond to environment, good environmental choices. So if you give them the opportunity to make a decision about, uh, uh, you know, a good environmental choice, there's a, a you know, a number of consumers, a, a growing number of consumers will take that choice. Uh, it's true to say that some of these large global seafood supply chains, particularly on global retailers, now are demanding certification within the seafood space. We know that. And a lot of the referencing is around these international standards, such as MSC and ASC, but I'm not suggesting it's not including global gap and it's not including ga's best aquaculture practice standard or indeed organic standards as well where that need fits um you know and it's probably good to say that um labeling doesn't automatically mean better prices it's as simple as that um i think it's there's a lot of other things involved in in terms of uh, marketing a product and achieving what premiums you may want to achieve than just having a label on the on the product on the EU set, I would say that the regulation is a good foundation for it, gives it strength uh, with, within Europe and it's internationally recognised as well. Um, the, and the organic, whilst niche, I would say is a definite segment. There's a definite market for organic products, so it's tangible in that sense. Um, and of course, we do have organic outlets as well who sell only organic products. And we do have retailers who have, have aisles which display organic products. So in terms of merchandising, there's opportunities there. Um, and maybe I'm just sort of putting this out, the largest scale producers will be more suitable or apt and interested in these, so like these bigger type, I'm saying international certifications such as MSC and ASC, but I'm not suggesting that it doesn't, you know, negate any entity of any size and scale being interested in this and, and taking that journey. Okay, that, that's, um, I think that's great. 
I think we might leave it here. I suppose I'm just thinking, and I've been asked on numerous occasions what I see, what's the difference between the circular economy and um, the bioeconomy? And really the circular economy is the what, the results to be achieved, whereas the bioeconomy is the how, the what type of bioprocesses um, should we be enhancing to get these expected results? So if we are looking at biophysical uh, processes to be developed, then we need to consider sustainability. And for me, and it's probably the auditor in me, I find certifications and regulations do have value. So if I think about the code of ethics that I'm professionally bound to, independence is key, but it's not only important to be independent, but it's so important to be seen to be independent. And I find the regulation and certification can give you that. So, I just want to thank you, Cleana and Roy, for presenting today and all of you who attended and interacted um, with us. So feel free to, con to contact us at any stage. I'm very conscious of the time, but I noticed that our colleague, Stephen Napier, the CEO from the Irish Bioeconomy Foundation is with us. So I'd like to ask Stephen to close the event. Hi, Maura. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to close this. Uh, can you hear me there, Maura? Is that okay? That's perfect, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, great. Listen, uh, first of all, I, I, I'm Stephen Napier from the Irish Bioeconomy Foundation. Uh, so weeks ago, um, I reached out to our friends in Uderos uh, when planning the Bioeconomy Ireland Week. And um, Irish Bioeconomy Foundation was one of the pillars of the organization committee. We wanted to ensure that the marine sector was brought to the fore, as it's very obvious that the sector plays a key role in achieving our climate targets and also a, a key player in the bioeconomy. So we were delighted with the assistance and organization, and it actually completely and utterly surpassed our expectations, which has resulted in very informative events today. Um, with, with Dave delivering, and I have to say, like to, 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 to the, the pleasure of seeing you Dave deliver and display a knowledge that 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 it was fantastic to partake in it you know today um, on that and also the scoping of a seaweed biorefinery concept for Ireland delivered earlier was also very relevant and we look forward to reading that report. Our team this year was build back better we recognize the difficult period that we're all going through but that that too will pass. Um, just, a, just a quick comment on, on, on the team of today. Uh, I, I think we all need to be brought on a journey, consumers, producers, everybody involved because Certification, uh, when I see labels of certified sustainable seafood, farm responsibly, organic, eco-friendly, and I suppose having experience in industry, I understand that the challenges of SMEs in relation to certification, paperwork compliance, and the fine balance of trying to stay profitable. So it's a journey we all need to be taken, taken on. And um, I suppose to conclude, to sign off, I'd like to sincerely thank Maura and all the team for facilitating today and the support of Bioeconomy Week Ireland 2020. I hope you all continue to stay safe, safe and well. And I really look forward to seeing the five kilometer restriction lifted and become unlimited so we can all experience the many joys our coastline can bring to us in both business and pleasure. So with that, I thank you all and, and thanks for your, your, your time today and, and to, for facilitating the Irish Bioeconomy to, to be able to partake in these two events. So thank you to everybody. Thank you all, bye-bye.